question. If you have uh, audio issues, uh, please use the chat feature. Uh, we are encouraging participant discussion and dialogue between the various experts in their fields. And we like lots of questions. We'll have a hard stop for lunch today around noon to one. And then if an individual presentation finishes early, we will proceed to the next agenda item. So the purpose of the meeting is to describe GRDA's overall progress in implementing its relicensing study plans. The results for each study plan to date will be presented. A meeting summary will be filed with FERC by uh, October the 30th of 2021. The meeting summary will include only the meeting agenda and presentations. All stakeholder comments uh, must be submitted in writing. And the deadline for filing these comments is November the 29th of 2021. Uh, here's the remaining relicensing study schedule. As you can see, uh, we've got an ambitious schedule coming up for the next year. And then these are the dates that were established in the uh, revised study plan when it was issued uh, several years ago. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And if there's not any questions, we'll start with uh, freshwater's sedimentation study. My name is Brent Teske. I am with Anchor PDA, or formerly Freshwater Engineering. So if you see those names, it's old us. Uh, we've been working on the sedimentation study along with um, Simons and Associates. So we'll start out with a general overview of the study and how we fit into that. Talk about some of the water level monitoring that Anchor QEA has been involved with. And then we'll talk about the sediment sampling that we've done to help support the sediment model development. So these are graph samples, something called sed flume sampling that we'll talk about in more detail, and then sediment transport measurements. Uh, once we have that covered, we'll move on to sort of the model development, what our planned procedure was, where we are with the current um, calibration procedures, and what we're planning on doing in the future. So hopefully this isn't a surprise to anybody. We're here talking about the Pensacola Hydroelectric Project. It's going through the FERC relicensing process. As part of that, they've been asked to evaluate the water levels throughout the watershed. Part of that was the upstream hydraulic model. Um, that is the UHM, which is part of the H and H study by Megan Hunt. And we were involved with that as far as doing some water level monitoring to help the calibration of the UHM. Um, the, another piece of the study is to evaluate the overall trends and the impacts of sedimentation um, within the basin and the reservoir. Um, this includes accumulation and how that affects storage, as well as accretion and erosion in some of the upstream reaches and how that might affect future stream flows. Um, for that sediment transport model, it is largely based on the UHM, but it does have to evaluate sedimentation, so it has some significant differences. One of those is that it requires additional parameters. For um, example, we need to know what the stream on stream beds and the lake is. We also need to know some of the inflow volumes for that sediment. And then once we have that, we can use the model to predict future deposition and erosion patterns. So moving on to the water level monitoring. We first got involved with this in December of 2016. Um, this is covered in our report as well, but there are 16 locations throughout the study area where we have pressure loggers installed. They've been recording at half hour intervals since that time. We've collected them roughly once per year. So we had trips in 2017, 18, and 19, as well as December of last year. So we have that half hour record running from December 2016 to December 2020, and it is continuing to collect data. 
Unfortunately, we, we do have some gaps in this record. Um, I believe that was alluded to with the UHM presentation yesterday. Um, these loggers were washed away during some events. Potentially, they may have been clipped by boats in some areas. They may have been vandalized. Um, and, and then there was one stretch where they were inaccessible due to high water levels and some of that internal memory fill. So we have some data gaps, but for the most part, we do have that continuous record. So moving into some of the sediment sampling, which is more directly applicable to the sediment model development. Um, in our um, FERC approved study plan, we were required to collect 30 samples of sediment. Um, this was different locations in the Neosho, um, as well as 10 samples in Tar Creek and the Spring River. When we collected samples in December of 2019, we actually collected 62, and we have the breakdown here. Uh, we had a handful in the Elk River as well, because that is one of the major tributaries. Um, when we collected these samples, we used the Ekman dredge, which you can see on the top right here. There were some areas that were shallow enough. We were also able to use a shovel or other means. Uh, and basically, what we found is that we have a mix of gravel and cohesive material in the river and the lake, respectively. So what we found, again, was primarily gravel and sand in the streams. So you can see this in the bottom right here. Um, the river sediment is primarily in that gravel and sand area, but then the lake bed tends to be more silt and clay. So these finer materials that are a little bit more cohesive. What that does is it complicates some of the sediment analysis. Um, here again, we're looking at a general size breakdown. We have sediment size along the bottom. Um, the percent finer then is on the left axis, and you can see again, uh, depending on which sample we're looking at, a lot of it ends up being either gravel or a mixture of gravel and sand. Um, so this is just a summary again of the silt and clay that we found in the lake bed, showing again we're mostly silt, we've got very limited sand in the lake itself. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with what I'm talking about with um, cohesive and non-cohesive sediment, this is an example of the non-cohesive sediment. It is your gravels, your sands, your small stones, things like that, where when we look at Grand Lake, we tend to see this mud. It's a lot more cohesive, meaning it sticks together a lot better and complicates our modeling efforts. And the reason for that is that when we're looking at sediment transportation, one of the most important pieces of information for us is called critical shear stress. Um, when we're looking at a stream flow, we have some amount of shear stress at the bottom. You can think of that as drag on the bed. And when we get to a high enough level, sediment starts moving. So the point where it starts moving is what we call critical shear stress. There's no transport below that critical shear. So it's something that is a very important parameter for model development. With non-cohesive sediment, like your sands and your gravels, this is relatively easy to evaluate. It's based on density of the particles as well as the grain size. Generally speaking, those larger particles are harder to move. We also find that it's relatively constant throughout the layer of sediment. So for example, if you have a gravel bar in the middle of your stream, the top of the gravel bar is going to be just as easy or difficult to erode as the middle of that bar and as the bottom of that bar. Uh, we also tend to see individual grains moving more or less independently. But when we're talking about cohesive sediment, like clay and silt, it's a lot different dynamics. So we're looking at cohesive forces rather than the weight of the particle. Um, this also is further complicated by the fact that it typically changes with depth due to consolidation. So if you look at the top of it, we have relatively little weight on that, and it's relatively recently deposited. As you move down that sediment column, you have more weight on top of it. It's been there longer. It compresses. It sticks together better. And then we tend to also see clumps of sediment moving together rather than individual particles. So because of that, we had to adjust our plan and we collected box cores, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is a big, clear plastic box that we have an open bottom on. And we press that into the stream bed or the lake bed where we expected or had previously found um, cohesive sediment. We pull that up and then we run that through what's called sed flume. Sed flume is a tool that is used to evaluate critical shear stress in cohesive sediments. Basically, the idea is we have water pumped across the surface of that core, 
at a known shear stress. And then we can raise that core to keep the surface of that sediment flush with the bottom of the flume. So as it flows across, we move that um, sediment up so that it continues being flush. And then we can get an idea of the erosion rate at a known shear stress. And using that information, we can then find what the critical shear stress is and get that information all the way through that column. Um, when we did this with the test, or had this test done, um, they gave us a lot of information here. I'm going to walk through it very quickly. We had sample depth on the left-hand side, so you can see how it changes throughout the column. We had median grain size. It generally was a fairly tight window, averaging around 12.9 mil, uh, micron. And then you can see the wet bulk and dry bulk density is generally lower at the top, which is what we would expect. And then as it gets compressed by more and more sediment, it sits there longer, deeper in the column. It ends up being a little bit higher. Um, loss on ignition is largely a measurement of the organic content. It's pretty common and they're, uh, pretty consistent throughout the column. And then the last handful of numbers is looking at the shear stress. So that tau symbol is referencing um, the, the critical shear stress in the case of tau C. And that is basically a best fit for a linear or a power function um, looking at the other parameters that they had evaluated. And then based on the information that is covered as an appendix to our report, they selected what the final tau C is or what our critical shear stress is. And one of the big takeaways here is that we see a lower critical shear stress at the top, and then as you move down that column, it gets higher and higher, which is exactly what we expect. It's pretty typical behavior. Um, so I guess I'll pause right now to take any questions in case that was, any of that wasn't clear. I don't see anyone asking, raising their hand. Great. So the next piece of that, once we know what is already in the system, is to look at sediment transport from upstream that's coming into the system. We are fortunate in the fact that we have four USGS gauges. We have the Neosho near Commerce, we have Tar Creek near Commerce, and we have the Spring near Quapa, and we have Elk near Tiff City. Um, the USGS periodically collects suspended sediment concentration, or SSC, samples. This is a measure of how much sediment is suspended in the water column. It tends to be primarily your silts and your clay, so those finer materials, whereas the heavier sands and gravels are not really suspended and they move along the bed. Uh, what we can do with this data is calculate an approximate volume of sediment that is moving through the system at a known stream discharge at each of these stations by fitting a line to it. Um, but we do see that we have some significant gaps in the USGS data set because these are only recorded at specific times. It's not something that is recorded on an hourly basis like some of the stage and discharge elevate, excuse me, discharge data that we have. So one of the things that we try to do is help fill some of those gaps in the USGS data sets. Uh, so we started out by bringing this equipment to the locations of those USGS gauges, followed their standard sampling guidelines, and then collected the suspended sediment measurements. Um, as I said before, this is largely going to be fine material. Um, you can see that sort of torpedo-shaped object. It's got a sample bottle in it. You drop that down, lower it into the water, pull it back up, and we have that analyzed for sediment concentration. And then we also have that load transport. Um, I had mentioned before that the sand and the gravel tends not to be in the suspended load. It's typically going to be along the bed. So we use a Heli Smith sampler, which you can see in this image. Um, basically, it sits on the bed of the river, and the water flows through it, and kept anything that is in that water is caught in a little net. Um, when we were out sampling at these locations, we did not ever have any bed load moving through. So at the discharges we sampled, we did not see any bed load movement at all. So we were able to help fill some of those data gaps in those USGS records. And Dr. Simons with Simons and Associates developed a, bit, or a relationship between the stream discharge and the total sediment transport. So you can see that here, we have stream discharge versus tons of sediment moving through the system. So from here, we had that data and we were able to start working on some of our model development. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the calibration and validation process, what we've done with that hydraulic calibration and some of the challenges we've run into. 
Um, so starting out, the sediment transport model, you see STM, that is what I'm referring to. It is largely based on the upstream hydraulic model. It is not the same, it is based on that and has some similar features. Uh, we had three terrain data sets, and when I say terrain data sets, I am talking about both the overland area, the topography, and the underwater area, which is the bathymetry. For ease, I'm going to refer to these by the year that the Grand Lakes part of it was done, or some common year. Um, the 1998 real estate adequacy study information was used as the basis for what we are calling the 98 um, terrain file. This is not all 1998 data, and I'm aware of that. But for ease, again, we're going to refer to it as 98. Okay, um, Brent. Yes. They, I guess kind of emailed that the audio quality is a little bit worse, so maybe try speaking up just a little bit. Sure. It was fine in the other room, but I just got a message, so. Okay. Apologies. I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Um, we also have the 2009 data set. This one is largely based on the 2009 Oklahoma Water Resources Board survey that was done at Grand Lake. It extends roughly to between bridges, and I believe it's about four miles upstream on the Elk. And the remaining areas of that are from the 2017 USGS survey. For the 2019 terrain, we had the 2019 USGS survey, which we talked about yesterday. And the upstream areas then are that same 2017 survey data. So the 2009 and the 2019 terrain files share the same upstream geometry. So our plan was to start with the 1998 terrain, do some uh, hydraulic calibration, create those sediment input files. Um, those files would be based on both the field data that we had collected as well as the lab analyses that we did. And then we were going to run that model from 1998 to 2009 as part of a calibration process to match the measured channel erosion and accretion. And then from there, validate that model by running 2009 to 2019. So we started off with the hydraulic calibration. We want to get the most basic pieces in place. And then once we're comfortable with that, then we add some complexity and start building on that. So our original goal here as part of this process to create the STM was to match the water surface elevation data that we had available. This includes those USGS gauging stations on the Neosho Spring and Elk Rivers, as well as Tar Creek and at Pensacola Dam. And then those high water marks that we had available, as well as the anchor QEA monitoring sites. Um, as we got further into this process, we ran into some issues with the 1998 geometry. Um, for it, one of the uh, first things we noticed was that at the Highway 43 bridge on the Elk River, we had a USGS gauge, and that water surface elevation that was recorded was below the 1998 terrain. So this profile here is showing you about a mile and a half of the river. That brown line on the top is the 1998 fall bay. So that is the low point in the stream. And then the yellow line on the bottom is that shared 2017 survey from the 2009 and 2019 data files. Uh, that blue X then is the USGS water surface elevation record. Um, that point is noticeably below the 1998 terrain file, which means that no matter what we do with that part of the model, we will never hit the USGS recorded water surface elevation. So we started looking into the 98 data set a little bit further. Um, we looked at the Neosho River above Tar Creek. This is a similar plot we're looking at. Uh, from the upstream extent of the model, this is around um, the commerce gauge on the Neosho on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, we are looking at the uh, confluence with Tar Creek. And one of the things that jumps out to us is that it's a relatively smooth profile. That's not something that we expect to see in most river systems. We tend to see some undulations, some bumping up and down, where we would have pools and riffles and some sort of inconsistency with that terrain. So when we see a profile like this, we start to think that this is based on relatively few cross sections and a lot of interpolation in between them. So it isn't as reliable. 
When we go a little bit further downstream, this is the upper Grand Lake area as we defined it in our model. Um, it, on the right hand side, we are looking at twin bridges. On the left hand side, we are looking at the confluence with the Elk River. The 1998 profile is again in brown. Here we have separate data files from the 2019 bathymetry and the 2009 bathymetry. So we have those both plotted. And what this is showing us is that there was apparently 20 to 30 feet of deposition from Grand Lake um, in this reach between 1998 and 2009. There's nothing in the record to indicate that that would have happened, and there's no huge change in sediment inflow that we're aware of that would have caused that, and then reduced down to a foot or two of accumulation from 2009 to 2019, if any accumulation at all. So here again, we're looking at that very smooth profile, and it also looks like it is not in the right, um, in the correct location vertically. So to address these inconsistencies, we are doing something that was um, a, a little bit different than what we had planned, but it was not required under our study plan to use that 98 data set. Uh, we looked at the original data as well, just to verify that we didn't have an error of translation when we brought it into our HECRAS model. Um, but it, it is a non-reliable data set as far as we are concerned. So we instead are going to calibrate the 2009 geometry for hydraulics. This is the same geometry that was used in the UHM. Um, and what we've seen so far is pretty good agreement with USGS gauges. These are results from the gauges that had hourly or better um, time outputs. Um, we did also look at the 2007 event as related to the maximum water surface reported at the Neo Show at uh, Miami gauge. We were about eight or nine tenths of a foot over the recorded water surface elevation at that point. Uh, we also looked at the high water marks here, and what we're seeing is about six tenths of a foot of over prediction with the July 2007 event, about five tenths of a foot under prediction for the October 2009 event and about 15 hundredths of a foot for the December 15 event. Um, looking at the um, anchor QEA logger locations, uh, we see about a tenth of a foot over prediction for the January 2017 event, and about a tenth of a foot under prediction for April 2017. So that, that all basically means that we are going to do our sediment calibration based on the 2009 to 2019 window this is going to be primarily in Grand Lake, some of the lower reaches of the Elk and the Osho, where we have different terrain files from the 2009 and two, uh, 2019 bathymetry um, surveys. And we also have known stage storage curves used to kind of validate our accumulation in that reservoir. Uh, so we have two methods to evaluate whether we really can go to the 2009 to 2019 data. Um, one of them is to compare changes from 98 to 2009 using um, an estimates from the stage storage curves. There was not a 1998 stage storage curve. Um, and, and then we can also use our terrain files to evaluate that. Another one was going to be looking at our terrain data sediment accumulation, to see what accumulation we had in the terrain file from 98 to 2009 in Grand Lake, and compare that to the erosion in the upstream areas is generally speaking, if we have a large amount of deposition in the lake that is beyond what we've normally seen, we should also see higher than normal erosion in some of those upstream areas. And then at this point, I'm going to pause and we can take a few questions. So far, no one's raised their hands. All right, <laughs> then I am going to pass this off to Dr. Simons for couple slides. Okay, so uh, Brent's um, presented the I'm sorry, just a second. Mr. Thomas just raised his hand. But I would yeah, like sorry. to go ahead and ask your That's okay. Yes, I'm so, I'm so, it took me a while to find the hand thing this morning. Um, I just have a couple of brief questions. Have you calculated the sediment volume that occurred since construction of the dam through 2019? So the 
average rate of sedimentation that's occurred since dam construction. Are you asking if we have looked at these change in storage on the stage storage curves? Well, that, that's a similar question. Yes. Yes. I don't have um, that number. From, that, that's fine. Yeah, I don't need the number, but you have calculated the, the loss in volume since construction of the dam through 2009. I mean, we're aware of the change in storage, yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, another question. You, you showed significant error at Logo 4. Where is that one located? Uh, that is on the Spring River. Um, I'm trying to remember which bridge that is. Is it the 10 bridge? It's on the Spring River. I don't remember the exact mile. Okay, River Valley. That's all for now. Okay. All right. So yeah, Brenda's basically presented the um, data sources, uh, the terrain files, the um, <clears throat> bed material both non-cohesive and cohesive, uh, the lab analysis uh, developing critical shear, and the sediment transport coming uh, down the rivers and into the reservoir. Uh, so one of the things that was just discussed is we are looking at the uh, volume changes, the loss in storage uh, over time, um, looking back from 1940, you know, to the present. And we've also, uh, we, we've developed these sediment transport rating curves and the, uh, we've looked at the tonnage of sediment coming into the reservoir from 1940 to the present uh, using these rating curves that we've developed coupled with the historic flow data. Um, so that provides a good background of information to uh, evaluate um, trends over time and and evaluate the uh, the results of the model. Uh, one of the things that that we're looking at is again the uh, the comment that was mentioned earlier the dense the sediment density and how it changes uh, in depth uh, within the water column or within the sediment column and. Um, seeing how that affects the model results as well. Again, this is the uh, a graph showing the stage storage relationship for the various surveys that we have available. We're taking uh, that into account, computing the loss in storage over time, and again, comparing that with the amount of sediment coming in based on the historic flow data and the sediment rating curves. So uh, to get started with the model, we, we ran a simple test case. And this shows the output from the HECRAS model on the Elk River, where we have the bed profile in black and the, the water surface in blue. And we set up uh, just a simple test case with the model uh, with uh, an incoming sediment load of, of sand. Um, and uh, as noted here, the, the test model is uh, not really representative of, of actual conditions because what we found is there, there's essentially no sand load <clears throat> flowing down the rivers, but it's more seldom claimed that this is just uh, to il illustrate um, how the model is working. And what we see is the uh, basically very little erosion or deposition on the right-hand side of the curve near the bottom, you know, just fluctuating around zero. And then as the sand load reaches the reservoir and the uh, slow velocities, that sand load immediately drops out and deposits. So this is just a demonstration that the 
uh, model is, is functioning as we would expect under this um, test case that's uh, unrealistic, but never, nevertheless uh, uh, just as a simple test. So currently we're in the uh, calibration process. And basically what we're doing is we're taking the calibrated sediment transport model and running it from 2009 to 2019 and then comparing the computed sediment deposition or erosion patterns with the survey pattern, uh, comparing that with the 2019 data. We're expecting that process to be completed by the end of this year. And then uh, once that's completed, there will be a report uh, to present those results. Then, of course, we'll, we'll expect to receive comments and, uh, and uh, uh, account for those in, in ongoing modeling efforts. Then once we have an, an accepted, calibrated uh, summer transport model, then we can use the, use the model to evaluate future operation conditions. Again, this just summarizes where we are, as I've discussed. Um, one of the issues that we're encountering is uh, this last bullet item, the, the bed material size distributions, as, as Brent showed earlier, we have um, quite a variety of sediment ranging from um, gravel, even cobble sized material in some locations, very little sand, down to um, the very finest of sediment. Um, we are looking at these calibration extents being limited to where we have this overlap of data, as Brent discussed, the 2009 uh, OWRB survey and the 2019 USGS survey that was presented yesterday. Uh, but as I was alluding here, this is an illustration of the, um, the wide range of bed material size distributions at essentially the same locations. So on the Neosha River, at River Mile 130.37, at one time when we collected data, we, we were sampling largely gravel size material as indicated in the black. And at a subsequent sample, when we did box cores, there were uh, uh, much finer sediments uh, as represented by the yellow. And we find this on a number of locations throughout the system. So this is Neosha River, Spring River, and uh, same thing on Tar Creek and Elk River, where there appears to be at some times a layer of fine sediment deposited on the bed. And at other times, that fine sediment is, is gone, and uh, uh, what we're seeing is the something closer to the original bed material of, of, uh, uh, of the gravels and, and uh, some sand. The other factors, again, are sediment density. There's a wide range in sediment density. The, uh, Non-cohesive sediments are typically on the order of 90 to 100 pounds per cubic foot. The, the uh, cohesive sediments range from maybe 20 to 80 pounds. So we, we have a wide variety of densities for the cohesive sediment. And as well, there's a wide variety in the cohesive, cohesive erosion parameters. This again summarizes the, the variety 
the, or the range in the density. We have a minimum of 21.2 pounds per cubic foot, ranging up to about 93. The, this graph shows the a plot of uh, critical shear versus depth. And as we would expect, there's a little bit of a trend of increasing critical shear with depth, but a lot of scatter. There's, uh, they're ranging from a few tenths of a pascal up to, you know, two and a half pascals, which is the, uh, the measure for a critical shear stress. So in summarizing, we, we've um, conducted the upstream development of the flow and sediment transport boundary conditions are completed. The, the downstream boundary condition being the historic water level in Grand Lake is obviously available and developed. We're in process of um, finalizing the initial conditions of the sediment properties, in other words, the bed material size distributions, and uh, finalizing the cohesive erosion parameters and densities. So we're, we're finalizing those uh, to describe the initial conditions in the model. And then, as we've discussed, we'll run the model from 2009 to 2019 using those parameters and then compare computed change in, in bathymetry um, that the model computes compared to the 2019 survey data. And then those results will be documented uh, uh, once the calibration is complete for review and comment uh, to those who are interested. Okay, turn it back to Brett, but are there any questions on uh, any of the material we've presented so far? Yes. Hi, um, Thomas. You have your hand raised? Yes, I do. Um, one thing I, I didn't see in it, well, maybe I missed it, was when the bed load sampling was conducted, as I recall from the report that you showed, there were very few bed load measurements collected at high flow. The majority of them were collected at low flow. Therefore, you likely don't have a good estimate of sediment transport rates at high flows. Will you continue to be collecting suspended and bed material samples? Yeah, Brett, do you have a, an answer for that? On the, well, for example, on the Neosho River, the highest flow for which we have bed load sampling was about 41,000 CFS. And on the Neosho, at least, which is the primary um, the Neosha River uh, produces the most sediment of any of the rivers. Uh, we have bed load data collected up to around 41,000 CFS, which on the flow duration curve is about the 99.7% level. So we, we have very good coverage on bed load on the Neosha River, which is the primary sediment producer. For the other is it for the other tributaries, we have bed load attempts at 750 CFS on Tar Creek, 23,400 CFS on Spring, and on the Elk, it was 4,940 CFS. And what was so the high, and you, you, you had one on the Neosho River at 41,000 CFS, but the remainder were less than about 20,000? Uh, the, the discharges on those rivers are not ever going, are not typically going to be the same. I would not expect to ever see Tar Creek, for example, carry 41,000 CFS. 
No, I understand that. That wasn't the question. The question was, on the Neosho River, the highest was at 41,000 CFS, and the remainder on the Neosho were at less than about 20,000 CFS. Is that correct? Um, yes. Uh, well, we had one at 37,500 CFS on the Neosho. Okay. Um, another, another question. You indicated that you're going to be looking at future operations or running the model over future operation scenarios. Are you going to be limiting that to the range of starting water surface elevations of 742 to 745? Or will you be looking at other starting water surface elevations such as uh, 730 or 740 so we can evaluate that scar will actually occur at the head of Grand Lake? At this point, I don't believe we are... At this point, we are not planning on evaluating those very low water surface elevations as starting points. Okay, uh, that's all I have at this time. Thank you. All right. So we talked briefly about some of the water level monitoring that Anchor QEA has been doing. Um, these were the 16 sites that we had, um, water surface elevation data as well as temperature data going back to December of 2016. We also covered some of the sediment sampling, whether that was draft samples at various points in um, all the contributing tributaries that were mapped, excuse me, evaluating. Um, some of the sed flume sampling and the results that we got from that, as well as those transport measurements that we were just speaking about. Uh, beyond that, we covered our planned procedure for model development, as well as some of the hydraulic calibration to date, some of those challenges that we ran into with primarily that 98 data set, and then um, covered what we are planning on doing with the sedimentation calibration. With that, I will open it up to any additional questions. Uh, yes, we have one from Walker Sanofsky. Walker. Hi. Uh, good morning. So just following up on the discussion you just had with Guy, it took me a minute, but I think I found the table in the report that shows the flow rates from those sample collections, right? It's table 5 on page 19. But uh, I think Guy may have mistakenly said that there was a sampling event at 41,000 CFS on the Neosho, but if I'm reading this chart right, the highest is the 37.5 you just mentioned, and then there are no others on the Neosho above 18.9. So I don't know if that if that reopens the discussion that you and I were having, but I just wanted to note that. I have a record of a measurement from July 1st of 2021 that is at 41,600 CFS. Okay, I think the latest date in the table I'm looking at is May 2021. So maybe that didn't make it into the report. We may have been waiting on some of the suspended sediment uh, calibration to the suspended sediment concentration data. Um, a lot of that was still in the lab at that point. But so you're saying ultimately you will have at least a 37.5 and a 41,000 CFS uh, suspended sediment measurement from the Neosho? Yes, we will have that. All right, well, I have a, another question, but I'm happy to let anybody else go that's in the queue. That's okay, keep going. We just have a guy with a raised hand still. Okay. Some other questions asked. Yeah, sure. So mine's kind of more of a process question. I gather you've hit some technical snags and you're kind of farther behind than you expected. Uh, I mean, so here we are nearly three years after the study plan determination, and we don't have any, you know, actual outputs of the study to review. And I gather that you'll, you know, you, that's not too far down the road and we're expecting to see that report in about December. And you mentioned that you'd be taking comments. What I was hoping to find out is whether under these circumstances GRDA would object to FERC reserving its right to resolve disputes over that report 
uh, along the lines that it's doing for all the results we actually have here in this ISR process in other studies. Uh, we're not going to talk about that process. You're welcome to suggest that, and we'll like, let FERC decide. I, I think I might have to take that as a, an, an objection to what I proposed. <laughs> put, it, put it in writing is what I'm asking you to do, and we'll respond to sure. it in writing, and then FERC will make a decision. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Walker? Uh, just one moment here. Or actually, no, if Di is in the queue, let him go. I'm done for now. Okay. Di, go ahead. Um, so in regards to the 1998 um, survey data or cross-section data, am I to understand you're not going to be using that in any way? We are not planning to use it at this time. We have a lot of reason to believe that it is not a reliable data set, and I don't see any reason to try to do analysis on something that we believe is flawed. Are there portions of the data set that you don't believe, or you just don't believe any of it? There are enough portions that I don't think we are comfortable trying to parse out and say this cross-section is valid, this one isn't, this one is valid, this one isn't. Um, as, a, as we've shown here, we have some um, sediment deposition evidence, or some suggestions from that data set that we have 20 or 30 feet of sediment deposition over a 10 year period, and then suddenly it stopped. And we don't have any evidence to suggest that something changed about the hydrology or the hydraulics or the um, sediment inflow to support that that kind of accumulation would have happened. Okay, right, but yet that data set has been used for numerous court cases and, and now we're discarding it. Um, oh, uh, one, one more question. Um, no, actually I'll stop for now. I'll have one in a minute, but please pass back to Walker for a second. Um, we have one other hand raised by Kevin Stubbs of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Kevin, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, it was along the lines of the same validation of that 1998 data set. I mean, is there any way to go out and try to take a core sample to measure whether you actually have that 20 to 30 feet of sediment accumulation or not? I, I think the only way we would be able to validate and show that that two, um, 1998 data set is correct is if we had a time machine and could go back and resurvey it. I don't think there's any good way to evaluate the age of the cores if we were to go out and collect 30 feet of core in one location. Any other questions? Kevin, are you good? Yeah, I'm just saying we we have some previous information on, you know, metal contents from, you know, previous core samples, and I was just questioning whether there was any way to, you know, take that core and age it, you know, to yeah. verify whether that 98 information is not valid or not. If there's no way to do it, then I understand. But uh, it was just a question of whether it was feasible or not. I'm not sure if it's even feasible. I do know that that is well outside of what our study plan that was approved by FERC has us doing. Okay. Uh, Kevin, if you'll just unraise your hand if you're good, 
Di, do you have another question or is your hand just still raised? I have another question. Uh, I have another question. You indicated okay. uh, you indicated that you're going to run the model for the period from 2009 to 2019, and that will be the calibration period. What period are you going to run to evaluate future conditions? For example, how are you going to develop a time series record to run from 2019, say, through 2040. I don't have specifics of that at this point. Um, I, I know we are planning to develop a synthetic hydrograph. Um, it's all written down in our FERC approved study plan what our um, what our project goals are. Okay. So so from that you haven't so you're confirming you haven't developed the synthetic hydrograph yet. We are planning to develop one. Will, will that synthetic hydrograph, will you be running any simulations that may take into account climate change or increase in peak flows or, or runoff over the period from 2019 to 2040? If that is in our study plan, we will follow what that study plan says. I don't have any further questions at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Walker, you've raised your hand again. Yeah, just Brent, uh, as far as the study plan and, uh, you know, what you'll do to identify kind of, you know, how things will look in the future. Um, I was uh, looking back at um, my screenshot of your slides. And, you know, one of the objectives you laid out is to, I think I'm quoting here, evaluate overall trends and impacts of sedimentation. So it seems like, I mean, identifying, if, you know, if we, if we think there is climate change, that would have an impact on trends, wouldn't it? We are looking at the, the trends in sedimentation. And, and would so trends in precipitation. Would trends in precipitation affect trends in sedimentation? I don't believe evaluating trends in precipitation is part of our study plan. So you think you can meet the objective of identifying trends in sedimentation without looking at trends in precipitation or hydrology? I think we can evaluate the trends in sedimentation according to the scope that was given in the um, in the study plan. And when you say the study plan, actually, can you just clarify which document exactly you're, you're pointing to? This is the, because the The record was a little, a little piecemeal on this one, and I can clarify it that way. But uh, what are you pointing to? Do you remember the official title of that document? Well, it would be a combination of the revised study plan and the study plan determination. I think primarily for this, when it came to the model, it was primarily outlined in the study plan determination. Okay. Can you give me one moment while I pull that up? Walker, maybe this is an opportunity for the city to put this question in writing. Well, sure, but, you know, I mean, as we, as we talked about in some context yesterday, you know, even if you disagree with us or you don't want to answer our questions, it's, it's helpful, you know, to hear whatever we're going to hear in terms of formulating our responses in ways that will, I think, be the easiest to evaluate for, for FERC and, frankly, for you to respond to. If you don't mind bearing with me one moment on this one. I'm almost there. Yeah, so the study plan determination on page B9, it, you know, it goes through both the GRDA proposed study plan and the one submitted by the city. 
And it concludes, however, the City of Miami's proposal provides a more clear, comprehensive, and standardized approach to collecting and analyzing the data necessary to adequately understand the potential effects of the project on sediment transport processes upstream. As proposed, the city study also addresses the concerns we have identified with GRDA's proposed methodology. Therefore, we recommend that the city adopt uh, the GRDA adopt the city of Miami's proposed methodology, specifically the use of HECRAD. So, I just want to make sure that you've got your eye on the city's study plan as you're going through this and working through your methodology. Specifically, like the city's use source of. Go ahead. And, and specifically, what the commission said was use HECRES. I think you just read that. I, I did, so yeah, but I don't is, read is, specifically as limiting. <laughs> I do. Um, we're using right. HECRES. If and and Walker, look, if if um, if after you've had a chance to review the um, the the uh, ISR and the city does not believe that we have followed uh, what the commission requires us to do, that is a great opportunity for the city to provide comments, and we certainly will look at those. Uh, look, we, we, well, understand, we, we understand that, as you said a couple of minutes ago, that we proposed to study, the city proposed to study, and the commission made a decision, and we're doing our best to follow what the commission asked us to do. Now, there are some things that we found when we got out into the field that were different than what the city assumed when the city proposed its plan. Uh, on the ground is much different. And so we're trying to address what we found on the ground in the form of a variance, which we were very upfront about when uh, we put the ISR together. But again, if the city does not believe that we're following what the commission asked us to do, Please put that in writing because, again, we, it's something that we want to address. Well, on the topic of what, you know, the variance in the ISRs, I think what the cover report says is the sedimentation study was completed with one schedule variance. I don't know that that's clear that you don't actually have outputs yet. And so, to my point from earlier, you know, you just said, you know, once you read the ISR, if you have issues with what GRDA has done, put them in your comments. Certainly we will. But again, what we're hearing and what the study, such as it is, says is we won't actually have results to look at until after the ISR process. So you can yes. see the pickle that puts the city in. Well, maybe if we had a better understanding of what the what was on the ground going into the study, we wouldn't be here today. And and let's not go back and review history today, but that's part of the reason why we proposed what we did. But, you know, we are where we are, and we're going to do the best that we can with regard to the time. All right, I think that's all for now. Okay, are there any other questions from anybody else? I don't see any other hands raised or anything in the chat or Q&A, so I believe this concludes the sedimentation summary. Maybe we take a short break. Um, so I know it's not on our agenda, but we are finishing a little bit early, so let's just take a, about a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back with uh, recreation. All right, we're going to start back with uh, recreation. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Sean Pusen with Eden Hunt. And I'm going to present uh, the results of the recreation facilities inventory and use survey that we completed during the uh, summer of 2020. A little bit about my presentation. Uh, I'm going to start out by talking about the study objectives and the schedule, then go through the study area, uh, talk a little bit about the methodology, then the results, have a little discussion about what some of the results mean, and then uh, go over the conclusion 
Um, all of this is outlined in the report in detail, and all of the raw data is provided in the report too. So um, I am just uh, presenting a portion of that data because we did collect a large amount of data in this study effort. The study objectives are, are fairly simple. Um, uh, one, the first study objective was to characterize the recreational use of the hydroelectric project, uh, estimate future public recreation demand, and in order to do that, we look at uh, population growth, uh, assess the condition of GRDA's FERC-approved recreation facilities, um, and then lastly, uh, evaluate the effects of continued operation on recreation. Um, we have the full evaluation will be included in Exhibit E of the license application. However, I will go over um, some results that we have obtained preliminarily uh, in the study. The schedule, as I said, the majority of the field work uh, was conducted May through September of 2020. Uh, the recreation study was designed to be a one year or one study period study. Uh, therefore, there are no um, additional study activities for study period two. Uh, looking at the study area, um, we focused on primarily um, recreation sites within the vicinity of the project. You'll see on the right, you'll see a map. I don't expect you to be able to tell exactly where every site uh, was that we visited. That's why I have them listed next to it. But um, the map is a, is a good visual to show that uh, we covered the entire reservoir um, upstream and downstream, um, including some of the river channel sites, the informal river channel sites that are downstream of the dam, and then also um, uh, some of the state parks that are downstream of the dam also. I want to point out that there are five, I, I talked earlier about FERC approved recreation sites. Those are sites that are contained within their current license. And those sites are Big Howl, Duck Creek Bridge, Monkey Island, Seaplane Base, and Wolf Creek. Uh, then we also looked at nine state parks. And then we looked at five additional sites. And then as I said earlier, we looked at the river channel sites uh, which are informal recreation sites downstream. The methodology that we used, uh, we used, uh, we completed recreation observation surveys in the field at each one of these sites. Um, at the same time, we took opportunities where we could to get uh, recreation visitors or recreationists to answer a survey that we had. Um, then we followed up with a facility condition assessment where we went to each one of these sites and particularly looked at the recreation um, enhancements or the recreation amenities, I guess is the word I'm looking for, uh, to see if any of them needed to be repaired or they were lacking in any way. And then uh, lastly, as part of the methodology, we're going to evaluate the operational effects. Um, in order to do that, we had both a survey, um, and I'll talk more detail about this, a survey questions about the effect of uh, water levels on recreation. And then we also took some pictures at the recreation sites. The observation surveys, uh, again, started in May and were conducted through September 2020. Uh, there were 30 one-hour visits to each of the 20 sites where we stayed at the site for a full hour and collected information on the number of visitors. And then also, um, those included six visits per month. Three of them were on the weekend, and three of them were on the weekday each month. We tried to uh, stagger the times throughout the day in which those visits occurred as much as we could, keeping in mind that um, we had uh, 20 sites to visit. Um, but we tried to stagger them as much as we could. And then we also, for the downstream informal river sites, we conducted bi-monthly surveys. Um, each month we tried to either visit that in the morning one time and then in the afternoon a, a different time during that month, a different day during that month. 
The visitor use surveys, um, they required a willing participant, somebody willing to be approached and say, would you answer a few questions for us? Um, we did that with, at the same time we were at the, at the recreation site for the full hour for each visit. And it was actually an electronic questionnaire. Um, it was a questionnaire that was contained on an iPad and it collected general use information. Uh, it asked if the person was a resident or a visitor. Um, it asked the purpose and duration of their visit, the vis distance they traveled to recreate, whether they were staying for the day or if they were going to stay overnight, uh, and any history that they had with visitation in the area to any of the recreation sites that, that, that we were, uh, the 20 sites that we were visiting. Um, it asked about the types of recreation that they usually participate in, their primary and secondary and other, their general satisfaction with the recreation in the area or, or a particular recreation site. And then they had a question about water level effects on their recreation. And that's key to us to determine uh, what the effects of uh, water levels have on recreation or project operations in the future. The condition assessment that was conducted by visiting each site specifically for the condition assessment. We did those on September 22nd and 23rd. We focused, as the study plan required, on the FERC approved sites. Uh, we took an inventory of the amenities and available parking spaces that were at each site. And then we signed a condition rating uh, to the site if it needs replacement or something needs repair it needs met, uh, maintenance or if it was in good working condition. And again, this assessment focused on the five FERC approved sites. For the project operations effect review, uh, we captured images um, at the site. Uh, if we noticed areas of the site were inundated, we captured uh, photos of the areas that were inundated. Um, and then at other times when it wasn't inundated, we also captured um, photos primarily of the uh, boat launch uh, because we wanted to determine that not only was it, if the boat launch was usable at higher reservoir elevations or if it was usable at lower elevations down to, I think the lowest elevation that we experienced was 742.2 as measured at Pensacola Bay. The water level surveys also had questions um, if um, the water levels uh, caused a problem with safely swimming at a site, if it caused a problem with launching or taking out a boat, safely boating, uh, caused problems with fishing along the shoreline, accessing the shoreline, using any docks, or if it caused problems with the scenic quality of the site. Um, one thing that I, I want to note about these survey questions is it asks the question for every site, regardless of whether there was a um, swimming area, designated swimming area at a site. So sometimes we, or whether there were docks at a site. Um, so sometimes we get a little bit awkward answers for that, um, but I don't think that affects the results uh, at all of, of the survey. For study results, uh, first of all, to characterize the use of, of this, um, we took recreation or visitor counts um, and the total number of visitor counts during our survey. Um, the site with the largest number of visitors was Little Blue State Park, uh, followed by Bernice State Park and Honey Creek State Park. You'll notice that the top sites visited are all state parks. Um, one thing that you need to know about Little Blue State Park is Little Blue State Park has a camping area, it has a swimming area in the creek, and then it also acts as the access to the informal uh, downstream river channel sites. So at times there's a lot of activity moving through that site and um, I think that number is slightly inflated by the number of people passing through, uh, not necessarily using that site because that is a relatively small state park. The other thing that we tracked are vehicles. 
um, and this goes to the capacity of the recreation sites uh, because normally um, recreation sites are most often limited by the number of parking spaces uh, at the facility. Uh, just an example, I'm sure all of us have gone to the beach and have been barely able to find a place to park our car, but we don't necessarily have a problem finding a spot on the beach to sit. So um, that's just a, an example of why we track the vehicles and the number of parking spaces uh, to look at site capacity. Uh, in this case, Honey Creek State Park had the most vehicles. Um, and with the exception of Wolf Creek Park, which is a uh, FERC approved site, that has a very large parking area and is used primarily for launching of boats and then also for fishing tournaments. Um, all of the sites with the most vehicles are state parks. So I'm just giving you an example of the recreation op use opportunities that are within the project vicinity. Um, I'm not going to um, go through all of these. Some of them that I want to touch on is um, uh, most of the sites have some type of a boat launch. Uh, so there's boating related uh, use there. Um, there's also a lot of people indicated that they use them for sightseeing, hunting or hunting access. I think we didn't specify whether it's hunting or hunting access. I think the primor primary um, hunting activity is using these sites as access for the boat launches. Uh, we had some people that said that they uh, enjoy rafting. Um, I think all of the sites, people made comments that they use for wildlife viewing. And then camping, I, I believe, only occurs at the state parks. So one of the objectives here is to determine uh, the adequacy of the recreation facilities. Um, so we did an analysis uh, using the most recent census data, looking at the county population growth uh, from 2010 to 2020 um, in the sites or in the counties that are included in the green country area, because we believe that uh, a large portion of the recreationists came from areas outside of the county and we wanted to make sure that we've got a much more uh, regional population estimate. Uh, you'll see those estimates, the ones in parentheses are negative numbers, are, are actually population decline. Um, but there are a fair number of also uh, fairly significant population increases in some of the counties. Uh, that comes to a total population growth over 2010 to 2019 um, of 4.5%. Um, coming up here, you will uh, receive a presentation on the socioeconomic study. And the socioeconomic study projects a population growth of the counties uh, in which the project is located of approximately 40% by 2075, which is about the next 50 years uh, after the license is issued. Um, so you can see by using a, a a factor of approximately 5% growth in the future, we're, we're pretty consistent with the findings of the socioeconomic study of 40%. Uh, we may be a little bit conservative on that and overestimating population growth, but I think that's fine you know, when we're talking about recreation site capacity. The facility condition assessment and inventory, the table on the right, uh, shows the five FERC approved sites that we did an inventory at. Um, all of the sites have a boat launch or boat ramp. Um, the Wolf Creek site, as I said earlier, is a very nice recreation site. It's very large, has a large amount of parking. Parking. It actually has six boat launching lanes, uh, two piers, four docks, a pavilion, restroom, trash receptacles, and picnic tables, unlike, in, unlike the other sites. It's a kind of a full service type uh, recreation site. Uh, in looking at the condition of these sites and doing the condition assessment, all of the sites received a, a rating of good, um, with the exception of the, um, the Monkey Island site. Uh, that received a, right, a, a rating of M, which needs 
maintenance, primarily because um, the access road is in poor shape and, and needs a little bit work beyond uh, grading. The other sites, uh, what was found is just normal maintenance. These are a lot of these are gravel aggregate surfaces and parking lots, and and you get people in there when nobody's in there that they like to uh, spin up the gravel a little bit. So they require general maintenance. Um, all of the rest of these sites too were lacking in a FERC approved or FERC recreation site uh, sign, which is uh, required under Part Eight. And so those are things that need to be added to all of the sites. Dot Creek, uh, there was a sign missing um, that for the steep drop off, I believe there you launch right into the stream channel. Uh, so there's a sign that needs to be replaced there. Um, and, uh, but otherwise the sites were in very good condition. Visitor use surveys. Um, now we're starting to lead into um, determining the effect of project operations or water levels on sites. Um, what you'll see is the question was asked, is safely swimming at a particular site a problem, not a problem, a small problem, neither, a moderate problem, large problem, or do you not have any opinion on it? Uh, the first site um, that's listed here uh, the Duck Creek site, we uh, were only able to catch one visitor there uh, that was willing to fill out the survey. Unfortunately, they had no opinion on water levels and the effect of that on that site. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the graph on the, or the table on the right. We've color coded it to make it easier to understand. Um, the sites that have no problem with water levels are listed in green or small problem are listed in green. The sites where people kind of had neither opinion either way are in yellow. And then when there became a problem, according to the survey, a moderate problem or a large problem, those are in pink towards the right. And then um, the no opinion or not applicable are in gray towards the far right in the table. So you can see from here that the majority of people, and those are percentages in there too, excuse me, uh, the majority of the people uh, indicate that water levels are not a problem at any of these FERC approved sites. Uh, with the exception of Duck Creek, we just don't have any data for that. Moving on to the state parks, similar type arrangement of the data in the table. Uh, you'll see here that there are some more additional people that are in the neither category, um, but there still is a large amount of green, and still very few in the um, where people indicate that there's a problem, a moderate problem, or a large problem with water levels. State parks continued, uh, very similar uh, to that, and all of this data is included uh, in the report, also included in the report, some of these uh, percentages are footnoted to give you an indication of the comments that were associated with it, uh, so you can understand what people's real concerns were um, if they had them. And then the last state park, Cherokee Riverside. Um, here you'll see um, also same thing, the primor primary uh, indication are that uh, they're not a problem or small problem with the exception of the launch or takeout of the boat. Uh, we have a little bit more people saying neither um, on that and that could be because this particular boat launch is downstream and um, it, it can receive um, some high uh, flow releases when the uh, spillway is under operation or the gates are open. The other access sites, the five other ones that we visited, Connors Creek, Council Cove, um, Connors Bridge, excuse me, and Council Cove, um, you'll also see that um, the primarily green uh, for that category. Um, Connors Bridge, and I'll show a picture of that, that 
that site does often um, get flooded in the spring, so that's maybe the reason for the accessing the shoreline is a moderate problem uh, due to water levels. I'm just continuing on with the remaining three sites. Uh, very similar, um, Riverview Park, um, it shows uh, Problems with safely swimming during uh, water levels. However, from my understanding, uh, there is no safe swimming area or a designated swimming area in Riverview Park. So this is one of the, the, the fine details uh, that comes from the way the survey was conducted, asking for opinions on um, sites, whether or not they had those specific amenities. Um, and then uh, river channel sites, I want to point that out. Um, it indicates that there are problems with accessing the shoreline due to high water um, or safely boating or launching a boat or swimming um, due to high water. Um, that's because that site is located downstream of the dam um, and it receives uh, spillway flow or um, when the gates are open. And also, there is no designated boat launch there. There's no designated safe swim area. And it's not really uh, an area that is, is designed for people to use as boating. Um, so those are the reasons for the low scores on that particular site. So um, regarding, and I'll go over these a little bit more. I'll have some specific pictures. But in order to determine the effects of water levels on um, recreation sites. We took pictures the majority of the time that we visited the sites. And uh, we were able to capture um, sites, site pictures um, when the elevation at the dam was 742.2 feet. And then also a picture when it was much higher at 748.29. Now, I want to point out that this is the elevation that's measured at the dam. We did not take any specific uh, elevation measurements at the particular site. And um, so it's possible that the water levels during the high flows could be higher at those sites during when the pictures were taken. OK. Recreation site capacity um, on here. Uh, I've talked about the sites that have uh, the highest amount of, of use and the closest amount uh, to uh, the, mo the least amount of capacity remaining here. And for this, we use parking as a capacity indicator here. We know the number of parking sites. We know the number of vehicles. And remember, we're looking at about a 45 to 5% population growth over the next 10 years. Um, so for Wolf Creek, um, you see the parking capacity is at about 53%. Um, we, it, for that figure, um, we did not use the entire parking area. We did not use the overflow area because we thought it would have skewed the um, the results slightly by uh, using parking area that's specifically designed to be used during tournaments. Uh, so you can see there at about 53% capacity. There's really no need to add any capacity there. Uh, Bernice Creek State Park, uh, that shows about 74% capacity. Um, and also considering a 5% growth over the next 10 years or so, um, there's no need to add any capacity there at this time either. Same thing with Honey Creek. Uh, Little Blue State Park, um, those numbers are again skewed by the number of vehicles moving through the site to access the informal river channel sites downstream. However, we do know that that site is relatively um, crowded with vehicles. Um, however, this is not the type of site that you can add easily add additional parking to it. Um, so if anything was needed to be done with that, um, there really isn't anything you could do at that site. And um, the other sites surrounding it don't have, aren't filled to capacity either. So I'm not recommending anything to be done uh, for that particular state park. Twin Bridges. Um, same thing, plenty of capacity remaining. 
um, looking at a 5% population growth over the next 10 years. Um, Cherokee's Lakeside and Cherokee Riverside, again, plenty of capacity remaining. So looking at the boat launches, um, I indicated that we uh, took pictures at, at kind of the extremes of water levels that were experienced during uh, our survey period. Um, this is the Spring River Bolt Launch. You can see on the left, uh, we're at an elevation of 747 or so at the dam uh, when this picture was taken. And then we also have a picture at 742.2. You can see that the site is affected um, with higher water levels. Um, people are still using it, however. Um, and then also this particular site is very usable, at least the launch is usable. Uh, at an elevation of 742. Looking at Riverview Park, um, you see uh, on the left uh, when the elevation at Pensacola Dam was 748. This is the elevation at the um, bolt launch. Um, and uh, you can see also in this picture that we were not visiting it at its peak. Um, when the peak water levels, because of the muddy uh, ramp there, you could tell that the water level had been high. Um, this site probably would still be usable. Um, I'm not sure I would want to launch into that uh, fast water there, but it's still usable. Um, at 742, again, it's usable at the lower reservoir elevation also. Twin Bridges Bolt Launch. Um, this is Twin Bridges Lower, is where the boat launch is. At 748, you can see that the state has closed the boat launch. Uh, it's unfortunately not usable uh, during those high water levels. But at 742, um, at the lower elevation, it's completely usable. Connors Bridge, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, Connors Bridge, the picture on the left, uh, 747 at the dam. Uh, the parking area is underwater on the left side and the boat launch is kind of to the right or just to the left of the road burn there. Uh, so you can see at this elevation this launch is not usable. Um, but at 742 it's usable. Wolf Creek boat launch. Uh, you can see it's usable. People are using it easily to launch at the higher reservoir elevations. Um, this is, uh, both of these are higher reservoir elevation pictures. Um, both of them are still very usable. Um, at Wolf Creek, however, uh, there's, a, I believe, a swim area here that's inundated and not usable at those higher levels. And then on the right picture at the higher levels, uh, the other two bolt launch uh, lanes are still usable, um, but they are affected a little bit more. And again, excuse me, at this site, there are six launching lanes. At lower elevations, uh, 742, these are the same, uh, same ramp, still very, very usable at the lower elevations. Sean, can you stop this? Sure. Have a... Walker, you had a question? Yes, yeah, so I think just a very quick clarification, just to make sure I'm understanding. The elevations that you're giving here, those are the, the reservoir stage at the dam, not the water surface at yes. the site being pictured? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I can't remember if I talked about these or not, but I don't really need to say much. You can see that they're very usable at 742. These are two of the other ramps at Wolf Creek. Honey Creek, uh, on the left, these pictures are taken, unfortunately, from different perspectives. Um, but the left, uh, on the left picture, you can see that the ramp is still visible and is still usable at that higher uh, water level. And then on the right, uh, the ramp is, is also usable at the lower elevation. Disney Bolt Launch. Um, the state actually has it closed. You can see the chain across it uh, at the higher elevation. Um, I believe that this launch is very close to the spillway gates, uh, so 
perhaps that may be a reason why it's closed. It still looks usable. Um, and then at the lower elevation, uh, it's also usable. Riverside, um, I believe this picture is taken from across the river. Riverside is across the river um, because I believe at these elevations we were not able to get into the particular site. So it's, it's not usable. And again, this is downstream. This is a downstream landing. And I'm giving you an elevation upstream of the dam just to indicate so you probably have a good idea how much flow is being released from the dam at this time. Since they are about 745, uh, um, I would imagine the core is, is controlling the uh, releases at that time. On the right is the boat launch at 742, very usable. Duck Creek. Uh, on the left, this is the access road into Duck Creek, so therefore it's, it's not usable at the higher water levels. Um, at the lower water levels on the right, you can see that that is usable. Seaplane base uh, on the left. Uh, this is one that we received comments about uh, being difficult to launch at higher water levels and then also very difficult to access the shoreline and you can probably see why. Um, I'm sure a person could launch if they wanted to. There's plenty of room in this parking lot, um, but there are plenty of other sites that are available for launch uh, if, if a person wanted to launch under these higher water levels. On the right, at the lower water levels, 742.2, very usable. Bernice Bolt Launch, uh, there's actually two launches there. Uh, both of them are still usable at the higher uh, reservoir elevation. Um, from, from land standpoint, uh, I'm not sure about the slope of the boat launch. Um, these are relatively shallow boat launches that even during uh, low water times, uh, they're kind of difficult to launch any deeper watercraft. Uh, this is at the lower elevations. Um, you can see that they're all still uh, usable at the lower elevations. So, um, some conclusions that we have drawn. Uh, ultimate conclusions will be included in the license application. Um, but some of the things that we're able to draw from this data is all the sites have adequate capacity for the foreseeable future, with the exception of Little Blue State Park. Um, I've talked about that, but that site is just unique, and it probably hasn't had any parking added to it because it would be very difficult to add parking to that site. No new recreation sites need to be or needs, need to be uh, established at this time. However, one of the things that we recommend in the report is that recreation use be evaluated. Um, during a, every so often during the new license, uh, because these things change, people's use, and recreation habits change, population growth changes, and things like that. So it's recommended that the recreation use continue to be evaluated during the future license period. Also, just because there are no new recreation sites need to be established, that doesn't mean GRDA should still be looking forward to the future and um, looking for opportunities to establish recreation sites if they come upon them. Some of the most popular recreation activities are camping, shoreline fishing, boat fishing, boating, and picnicking. All of the FERC approved recreation sites were rated as good uh, with the exception of Monkey Island, uh, primarily because it needs signage work, it needs grading of the parking lot, but it also needs um, some work on the access road into it. It's a very short access road. Not a lot of work needs to be done there, but, but I felt that it, it, it needed, uh, needed the rating of M. All boat launches are accessible and usable at elevations of at least 742.2, if you want to put a .2 on that, uh, because that's what we have pictures for, but I'm pretty sure they're still usable at 742. Nine of the 16 boat launches are still accessible uh, at elevations exceeding 747, um, but those are, again, elevations that are uh, measured at the dam. Most respondents indicated either no problem, a small problem, or neither regarding the effect of water levels on recreation. 
There are some exceptions to that, but I think overall uh, the effect of water levels uh, on, on the sites is not viewed as a, as a major problem by any of the recreationists. Any questions? Yes. We have one question uh, from Josh Johnston with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife. Josh? Hold on just a second. Looks like. Okay, try it again, Josh. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just had a, I had a quick question. It seemed like you, uh, you looked at parking, parking available. Was it good enough at areas that had travel? But I think it kind of sits. I'm just going to make a suggestion. There's five first approved sites. I would suggest that the reason you will never run into somebody at Big Hollow is because there is absolutely zero parking. It's uh, in a person's yard, and I've had reports. I would say not a lot of them because it's out in the middle of nowhere, but um, multiple anyway, reports of people being told, hey, you can park here, uh, this is my yard, or I can't turn around, that sort of thing. So maybe we don't need more access sites, but if that's going to be a FERC approved access site and we need five of them, I suggest that one be moved because I think you would have looked into the parking thing before asking somebody about the parking, you would have found out the reason that no one was at Big Hollow was the fact that there is zero parking. That, and my second comment would be, if you notice on the first approved um, sites of very low use areas, um, one major reason for that is because there is no courtesy or mooring docks at any of these places. So it's hard for people to use these access sites and pull their their boat up on the rocks. It's just not a good thing. So a lot of times they're using um, state parks or private areas, with the exception of Wolf Creek, which is very well done. These other ones are not inviting to people trying to launch a boat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Kevin Suggs with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You have your hand raised. Yeah, um, for the population growth, uh, it looked like all the counties you were using were from Oklahoma. I mean, there is some considerable growth, you know, in some adjacent states there. Was that looked at? We didn't, we didn't extend it out to other states. Um, and the reason being is, is, is we still believe that um, this particular the counties, instead of going to the other states, we expanded it from the counties where the project exists in to the entire green country of Oklahoma instead, uh, which brought in um, uh, Tulsa area and so forth. So we believe that that's a good surrogate uh, for going outside of state. Um, I think I think our our overall our overall study area for population growth, I think, is, is enough um, to determine what we needed to determine here. I think also, um, you know, we're not really on the cusp of any significant problems with any of these recreation sites that we need to fine tune it that much to bring in the other states. Did your survey questions, did they ask if the person was you know, yeah, from yeah, they asked Oklahoma. where they were from. Yeah. Okay. Um, another more of a suggestion is that I think there's opportunities to expand recreational use along the lines of fishing, hunting, and at least canoeing, kayaking stuff with expanding, you know, river access you know, upstream. Uh, it's a kayaking and things like that are becoming increasingly popular and river access is a limitation for a lot of people. Okay. Okay, Kevin, anything else? That's it. 
I just want to encourage people to file these comments with us so that we capture them for our analysis. That, that's obvious, but I wanted to mention it again since it hasn't come up in a while. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, just a reminder, uh, Brian touched on it this morning in the opening uh, slides that uh, the meeting is being recorded, but please put your comments in writing and file them with FERC by November 29th, and we'll be responding to them. Okay, um, any other questions before we move on to socio? Okay, our socioeconomics prisoner is going to be doing this virtually. Um, she's unable to be here in person. So if you'll give us just about five minutes to get her hooked up, we'll start her presentation at 11. Okay, this is our first uh, virtual presentation. Um, we have Rachel uh, with Intercon and Jerry here. If you run into issues uh, with the audio, please send either me an email or a chat a message um, so we can fix those quickly. All right, Rachel, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. To confirm, audio is, is good, correct? We can hear you, yes. All right, well, good morning. My name is Rachel Turney Work. I'm with Intercon Services, and I will be presenting the Social Economic Studies Survey Summary today. My colleague, Jerry Riggs, who's sitting there on the screen as well, um, is also here to support technical questions as needed. So today we're going to um, kind of walk through in an introduction to the, to the socioeconomic study. We're going to look at some specifics of the report topics, which includes land use, population trends, demography, housing trends, both in availability and value. Um, we're going to look at economics, both with the study area and GRDA. We're going to do a summary of the income and poverty statistics. We're going to talk about the stakeholder outreach that was conducted as part of this study, and then look at the cumulative income analysis, and then we'll, we'll do a summary at the end. So the purpose of the socioeconomic study was to gather, analyze, and report on available information to qualitatively evaluate the socioeconomic effects of the Pensacola project in the study area. As you can see on the figure to the right, the Pensacola hydroelectric project is located in northeast Mays County, and portions of Grand Lake lie in Mays, Craig, Delaware, and Ottawa counties. As such, the study area for the socioeconomic study consisted of this four-county area located in northeastern Oklahoma. Looking specifically at some of the topics, we're going to start with land use. And so for land use, the study reviewed general land use trends. We looked at parts of recreational areas around the lake, and, and we did view some of the shoreline development. Um, looking at land use, land cover, primary cover types in the Fort County study area are agriculture and forest at approximately 86%. Um, developed areas cover approximately 6%, include residential, commercial, and industrial, and recreational development. We're comparing the 2001 and the 2019 Rachel, land use. Yeah? Rachel, can you stop just a second? Your audio is cutting in and out. Okay. I don't know if it's because you're moving or if it's, it's just kind of fading in and out. Okay, I'm sorry. That's I'll, okay. I'll back up. Yeah, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So. And then. Yeah, why don't we have you turn your video off? and see if that, because there's kind of a lag between your video and your audio. Maybe that will make it a little bit clearer. Um, and really quick, just a second, I think we had a raised hand. Okay. Uh, Di, did you have a question? Um, I didn't have a question, but I was just going to comment on the same. I'm having audio and video trouble here. So thanks for raising okay. that. Okay. You're welcome. Walker, did you have something? Oh, just dropped in the Q&A that uh, Rachel was speaking a little quicker than some of the presenters have. And so I think, you know, 
if she could slow down a little, that might help mitigate the, the choppy audio too. Okay. That's a suggestion. Thank you. No problem. So let's we turn your video off and just maybe slow down just a little bit and we'll see if that fixes the audio. Okay. Sounds good. All right, I'm gonna kind of restart with land use just to make sure everybody hears the content. So for land use, um, our study reviewed general land use trends, parks and recreational areas, and shoreline development. When looking at land use land cover, the primary cover types in the four county study area are agriculture and forest at approximately 86%. Developed areas cover approximately 6% and include residential, commercial, and industrial, and recreational development. When comparing the 2001 and the 2019 land use data, this area has seen very little change. In fact, the biggest land use change during this period was hay and pasture which showed an approximate 2% decrease. So that kind of gives you a scale as far as the change or how little change has occurred. Regarding parks and recreational areas, Grand Lake is a popular location for recreation and residential development due in part to the scenic quality of the reservoir and surrounding landscape, the availability of recreational fishing and proximity to major population centers. There are five state parks and numerous privately operated recreational sites around the lake. GRDA operates and maintains five of these recreational areas, including those listed on this slide. Shoreline development along Grand Lake primarily consists of residential and commercial and some agricultural lands. Okay, Rachel, can you stop there? We have a question. Um, Shannon O'Neill, can you introduce yourself? Because I think this is the first time that you've had a comment today. Sure, and um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, Shannon O'Neill on behalf of the City of Miami. I just have a quick question regarding some of the data that you looked at in putting together this study. Um, I, I know that the, the study plan determination noted that you'd be including available information on general land use patterns in the study area based on a, a broad assessment of population trends, economic activity, age, income, et cetera. Um, and I just, I was curious, uh, did the data you looked at and the study is conducted um, consider any specific environmental justice statistics? Uh, I'll note that that's been a recently announced focus from FERC and there's been a executive order out of the Biden administration asking agencies to take a, a more concerted look at that. So I I just wondered if any of the statistics you considered were specific to issues of environmental justice rather than uh, socioeconomics more broadly. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shannon, for the question. Um, so as part of the FERC approved study plan, we were requested to provide track level demographic data to as part of the report, which we did, and that FERC was going to cover environmental justice as part of their analyses. Understood. Uh, thank this, you. This, this is Jerry, Jerry, this is you specific. They were requesting tabular data. So, That's correct. So. You're on the I just did. I oh, didn't say it again. Yeah, say it again. I said, uh, to be specific, uh, FERC request the tabular data. That's right. I'm, I'm sorry, Gary. I, I'm having a little trouble with the audio. Could you repeat that just one more time? Gary said that the FERC approved study plan requested tabular data. So, so to answer your question, Shannon, the, this, the socioeconomic study does not include environmental justice in it. Understood. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or, or I can move on? Um, Walker, did you have a question? It doesn't say that your hand's raised, but showing me that you asked questions. Okay, it looks like you were typing in the QA about the audio, so that's why. 
Okay, uh, Rachel, I think you can carry on. Shannon, will you unraise your hand for me so I don't get confused? Thank you. All right, for population, GRDA evaluated the population trends within our four county study area and the state of Oklahoma between 2000 and 2020. Population was also projected out to 2075 based on information obtained from the Oklahoma Department of Commerce, specifically their demographic state of the state report from 2012. Interestingly, population within the four counties showed similar trends and that they all increased between 2000 and 2010. And now, according to the 2020 census, are all showing a decline over the last decade. In contrast, the state of Oklahoma has had consistent increases between 2000 and 2020. The projected population for 2075 shows an increased population trend for the study area and the state, with the exception of rural Craig County, who is predicting an approximate 6% decline. The socioeconomic study also provides a summary of demographic data within the four county study area and provides track level demographic data in attachment A of the study as requested in the FERC approved study plan. In general, the percentage of minorities in each of the four counties is comparable to the overall percentage of minorities in the state of Oklahoma. Similarly, the percentage of persons with a high school degree or higher is fairly consistent across the study area and the state with values ranging from approximately 84% to about 88%. For housing, as I mentioned before, we're going to cover both housing availability and housing value. As you can see on this slide, housing availability within the study area had a trend that was very similar to population and that it typically increased between 2000 and 2010 and then decreased between 2010 and 2020. The one exception to this was Ottawa County, where total housing and occupancy has shown a decline since 2000. Within the 20-year 20, 20 period, the greatest percent change occurred in the vacancy units category, which showed increase for all counties and the state between 2000 and 2010 ranging from a 12% increase in Ottawa County to a 35.5% increase for the state of Oklahoma. However, as noted above, this category also showed a decline across the study area between 2010 and 2020, with the exception of Mays County, which saw a continued increase throughout the 20-year period. Rachel, we have a question. Uh, Shannon? Hi, um, thanks Rachel. Uh, I had a quick follow-up question on what you looked at in terms of analyzing housing trends. Um, I know in the SPD that you were drawing data from publicly available information. And so I was curious if in putting this together, you included in the information from other federal agencies such as FEMA and HUD uh, due to the expansion of the or concerning the expansion of the floodplain, um, the rising cost of flood insurance, uh, how that might impact the housing stock available to people in the area. I know there's also, you know, anecdotal reports from the residents of the area regarding um, cities and neighborhoods that are being flooded, and that has obviously an impact on housing availability. Uh, I was just curious. What what exactly did you draw from in putting together these numbers, and did it include any of those items I mentioned? So the majority of the information we used was from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, Jerry, do you have anything you'd like to add to that response? No, no. Yes, you can speak. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, we used mainly U.S. Census Bureau data. Uh, and we were lucky this year because 2020 census came out in time. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, I have nothing to add to that. That's right. We use census data. Thank you, sir. So 
So Shannon, no, I, we did not pull information from FEMA or HUD, um, but if you do have a comment in regards to that, we'd appreciate if you'd submit it in writing. Understood. We, we certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have one more question uh, from Kevin Stubbs of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service before we move on. Kevin? Yeah, uh, similar comment is for the recreational use. Um, I'm not sure why the study area would be limited to just the Oklahoma counties. I mean, there's parts of Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas that are uh, just as close to the lake as, you know, Craig County is. Um, why wouldn't we include some information from those at least adjacent counties in other states. Thank you for the question, uh, Kevin. So you know, the four county study area was defined in the FERC approved study plan. Jerry, would you like to elaborate on that any further? No, no that's, that's exactly where we got that uh, four county area from the approved study plan. So we stuck with it. That's, that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, it looks like we don't have any um, further comments. Uh, so carry on, Rachel. Thank you. So when looking at housing value trends, both median housing values and median rent showed an increasing trend throughout the 19-year period for both the study area and the state, although the rate of increase did change between the first and second decade. The greatest increase in housing values, as shown in the table to the right, occurred between 2000 and 2010 in Craig and Ottawa counties, which both experienced increases in housing values at about 67%. Both of these counties continue to show an increasing trend from 2010 to 2019. However, the rate of growth decreased significantly for both. Median rent also showed some fairly dramatic increases during the time period, with Mays County showing an increase of over 47 percent. Similarly, the rate of growth for median rent between the first and second period of analysis also showed slight decreases. Overall, changes in housing and rent values are comparable to the changes that occurred at the state level. All right, for economics, the socioeconomic study looked at the employment sectors, total employment, and the gross domestic product for the study area and state. The primary sectors of employment in the study area include government, agriculture, and manufacturing. For Craig and Ottawa counties, state and local government were the largest employment sectors, whereas for Delaware, it was agriculture and maize was manufacturing. Other industries were represented as well in the state study area, including retail, construction, real estate, health care, transportation, entertainment, forestry, and utilities. The total employment in our four county area is over 56,000 jobs. Between 2014 and 2018, the U.S. Census Bureau reports show that the percentage of population that contributed to the labor force ranged from approximately 56 percent for Mays and Ottawa counties to about 48 percent for Delaware County. When looking at economic impacts, GRDA has provided multiple benefits to the study area and to the state. Between 2015 and 2020, the operations of GRDA is estimated to provide between 510 to 581 million to the state economy. GRDA supports over 7,100 jobs, with 25% of those directly related to the Grand River Energy Center. According to the Oklahoma Department of Commerce, the estimated economic impacts resulting from tourism, 
uh, or sorry, es sorry, the estimated economic impacts resulting from tourism, the quality of life and relative power costs, all provided by GRDA, included, including its Grand Lake facility, was expected to contribute approximately 240 to 260 million to the state of Oklahoma between 2015 and 2020. In 2018, the Oklahoma Tourism and Recreational Department noted that total spending on recreational travel in the study area ranged from $18 million in Craig County to over $194 million in Delaware County. The socioeconomic study also Wait, evaluated... Oh, yes. I'm sorry, uh, the question... Raise a hand question happened as you were changing your slide. Uh, Mr. Reese, do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I, I, this is Bo Reese, city manager of Miami. And, and since I've been city manager for the last nine months or so, I've, I've had some conversations with supporters of the RDA that are generally some po are, are positive and talk about the positive impacts the RDA has made on Miami. But but it often comes to the comment that the city of Miami has collateral damage to those benefits. Do you, do you plan on doing any study to concentrate maybe on the negative externalities of the Pensacola Dam that are really unfairly borne on the upstream communities as opposed to just what happens, uh, the positive impacts around the dam specifically, which is what this slide kind of talks about? Jacqueline, I'm not sure I heard the question completely, but is that something that the GRDA would like to respond to? I, I can respond to that. Um, and the uh, the immediate response to the question, Mr. Reese, and this is Chuck Sense of the Legal Counsel for GRDA, is uh, we're following the study plan that FERC required us to do. Um, and to the extent that the, um, the allegations in your comment are addressed, it's, it's captured, we think, in the study that FERC required us to do. Okay. Okay. So that, that does answer my question. Yeah, we haven't looked at the differences uh, upstream versus near around the dam, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I see, Bo, will you unraise your hand for me just so I don't get confused? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And then I see Shannon O'Neill, you raised your hand again. Shannon? Oh, thank you. I was uh, still muted for a second there. I just I wanted to follow up on Bo's question and just as a general matter, again, in, in terms of understanding what exactly was looked at here in, in putting that together your overall economic understanding of the effects pursuant to what you're required to do in your study plan determination. Did you make any specific attempt to identify negative and uh, negative economic impacts, or was it more just a, a very broad net overview? Uh, again, maybe you didn't hear my response. We did what FERC asked us to do. If, if you don't think that we did what FERC asked us to do, this would be something for you to comment on. Thanks so much, Chuck. We, we certainly will. Thank you. Shannon, if you'll unraise your hand for me just so I don't get confused later. Yeah, questions. And uh, Rachel, I think you can pick back up where you left off. Okay, thank you. The socioeconomic study also evaluated income and poverty for the study area and the state using the latest available data. So in this case, it was 2019 information. The median household income ranged from 39,000 in Ottawa County to almost 49,000 in Mays County. 
For comparison, the state of Oklahoma's median household income was approximately 51000 Similarly, the per capita income for the four-county area ranged from 20, just over 20000 in Ottawa County to 23861 in Mays County, and all four counties had a lower per capita income than the state of Oklahoma. According to the U.S. Census, in 2019, the percentage of people living in poverty is consistently higher in the four county study area than for the state of Oklahoma. As such, if the Pensacola project is not relicensed, the loss of economic benefits could add to the already burdened poverty rate of the study area. Okay, when looking at the stakeholder outreach, um, as outlined in the FERC approved study plan, GRDA sent letters to 179 stakeholders. As part of this outreach, GRDA requested input on industry trends, trends in land, land and resource values, as well as other socioeconomic information that may be relevant to our socioeconomic analysis. The recipients of these letters included local and state federal agencies, tribal organizations and individuals, congressional delegations, NGOs, and interested public residents. GRDA received responses from eight of these stakeholders. The U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs sent a letter that requested the individual tribes provide input. GRDA confirmed that all applicable tribes were included as recipients in this outreach. The city manager of Grove um, in Oklahoma sent a letter in support of the project that noted that Grand Lake and the tourism events associated with it contributed to the city's revenue. The historic preservation officer for the United Kituwa Band of Cherokees also sent a letter in support of the project that noted that continued success of this project um, benefited the, the United Kituwa Band of Cherokees people that reside in these local communities. The state of Oklahoma provided a letter stating that they had no comment or relevant information to provide. The Grand Lake Commander of America's Boating Club also provided a letter in support of the project and noted that GRDA is a good steward of the lake. Three responses were received that noted some concerns, primarily around flooding and its potential impacts to emergency management and transportation. GRDA responded to these concerns in a letter to FERC dated October 6, 2020, and noted that GRDA solicited stakeholder input from emergency managers on both transportation and flood control as part of their infrastructure study. These three, these three letters came from the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, the City of Miami, and Larry Bork et al. Rachel, we have a question from Mrs. O'Neill. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Rachel. I know that you noted that you received, one of the stakeholders who received feedback from was the City of Miami. Uh, in circling back to my previous question about whether you specifically assessed negative in impacts, did you look specifically at negative impacts on the city of Miami? And again, this is this is just a just a yes or no question. Just trying to assess what was considered and put together the data. Shannon, do, do, do you view the FERC approved study plan as requiring that? I view the, the study plan as fairly broad and not specific as to what was required specific to socioeconomics. And so I'm, I'm really just trying to get a sense of what was considered here so that we can understand whether there's anything that we would like to comment on. Um, but for my sure. notification, I'm, I'm just asking asking the questions about what was actually looked at. Yeah, and, and I think from our perspective, again, 
Um, I, I, I take it that your answer is no, the FERC study plan did not re specifically require us to look at that. I think the study plan is fairly broad as to what was required and what was approved. So again, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what within the broad mandate of the study plan you chose to analyze and putting together your understanding of the socioeconomic situation. So I'll have Rachel answer that question, but I'm going to take your answer as a no. FERC did not require us to look specifically at Miami, and that's the way that we view the study plan as well. So you, okay, uh, I'll, I'll defer to Rachel's answer, but I'll, I'll also take that as a no that you did not specifically consider impacts on the city of Miami. Yeah, again, we are required to do what the commission asks us to do. Yes, and so Shane, it might be, um, I think to, to Chuck's point, you know, we did what was required by the, or approved through the study plan. So if you have an additional comment, we ask that you provide that in writing. Sure. Um, I, I do actually have a, a follow-up question regarding stakeholder outreach, if I may. Please. So you, you know that you sent letters to 179 stakeholders requesting input, um, but only received responses from eight. So consider whether that response rate might be indicative of a flaw in your information gathering process and whether maybe any additional outreach might be necessary in order to avoid deficiencies. The recipients selected for the outreach were, were carefully reviewed and the, uh, the information as far as addresses and, and uh, for those recipients were, were reviewed as well. I can also tell you that if we received a response back that, that the letter was not received, then we would check um, and resend the letter to, the, to a, a more appropriate address. Um, we did include that as part of the process. Okay, um, and so am I understanding there's, you didn't look at maybe whether there was a better way of conducting the outreach or also more specifically, did you feel that this was a sufficient level of stakeholder response to generate non-deficient data? I, I feel that the number of people that we reached out to for input absolutely was sufficient um, to garner uh, to, to, to garner a sufficient outreach process um, as far as the responses received you know we can't control the the input from those that outreach and in similar projects that i've seen um, that i participated in you know the the results of the outreach has been similar But Jacqueline, I'll just ask, does GRDA have anything further they'd like to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to, to ask Shannon if her client responded to the outreach request. Regarding socioeconomics? Yes, we, we, I'm looking at a slide that shows us that the city of Miami responded. And I believe that you are counsel to, to Miami. So I'm just curious as to whether you're, we accurately captured that Miami responded to the outreach. Yes, I mean, that, that was not okay. the question. But. Yeah, I know it's not the question, but I think it helps answer yours. Okay, are there any other questions from anyone else or anything else from Shannon before Rachel moves on? No, I mean, I, I will uh, note that our the city's response was largely concern over the, the outreach methodology, methodology itself.
but uh, no further questions on this point at this time. Okay, thank you. Will you raise your hand for me? And Rachel, you can carry on. Thank you. So the study also evaluated potential cumulative impacts associated with the Pensacola Hydroelectric Project. Cumulative impacts are defined as potential compounding socioeconomic impacts associated with the continued operation of the project during the proposed operating term with past, present, and re reasonably foreseeable future actions. For the purposes of this analysis, the past actions were defined as those related to resources at the time of the hydropower plant licensing and construction or to the earliest data of available data. Present actions are those related to to the resources at the time of current operation, and future actions are considered to be those that are reasonably foreseeable through the end of our power plant operation. The findings of this analysis noted that the continued operation of the Pensacola Hydroelectric Project is not anticipated to result in noticeable changes to land use trends, population and demography, and housing. Thus, it's not anticipated to have any cumulative impacts for those topics in conjunction with past, present, and future actions. The Pensacola project does provide noticeable continued beneficial economic impacts to the four-county study area by creating jobs and providing pathways for higher wages and assisting in the reduction of poverty. Because the proposed relicensing is not expected to result in adverse socioeconomic effects, the continued operation would not result in cumulative socioeconomic impacts in conjunction with any past, present, or reasonably foreseeable actions. So in summary, GRDA and the Pensacola Hydroelectric Project will continue to benefit the employment economics of the four study county area through job opportunities, higher wages, and support of local tourism. And the continued operations of the Pensacola Hydroelectric Project are anticipated to have no adverse socioeconomic impacts. Thank you. It looks like uh, Shannon and Walker have raised their hands. So Shannon, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, and thanks again for that, Rachel. Uh, as a, a general follow-up question, I uh, noted on page three of the ISS cover report that the socioeconomic study is listed as complete. But the study report itself says that the proposed operations model and hydraulic model will provide information to evaluate any reasonably foreseeable effects that has a reasonably close causal relationship to hydroelectric project operations or USACE flood control operations. Um, so I was just curious how and when the socioeconomic study will be updated to reflect the H&H &H results. Well, thank you for your question, Shannon. Um, I, what I'd like to do is ask you to, to submit that question in writing so that we can address it. I, I think I have an answer to that. Um, the, the socioeconomic study, as the commission required us to do, is now done. But, um, Shannon, you raise a really good point, which is how do all of these studies come together to analyze overall the effects of the project, because certainly that's an interdisciplinary exercise. And that analysis will be done in Exhibit E of the license application. Okay, so or do I understand you to say that we'll see further, we won't see further updates on this until the filing of the application? Yeah, I, I think what I said was the socioeconomic study is now done and the analysis of project effects that will be an interdisciplinary exercise will appear in Exhibit E of the license application. All right, so socioeconomics for 
your purposes is complete, but there may be further discussion in Exhibit E? I think I said analysis, yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I guess a, a follow-up question I had for probably for Rachel is the city in in his comments on the proposed study plan requested information collection on a wide range of socioeconomic values and GRDA noted in the revised study plan that it would query all relicensing participants as well as other county, regional, and state entities for relevant information uh, as part of the study and will provide the information identified in the comment to the extent it is available. Uh, so I was just curious in terms of putting together this study report and looking at all the information. Did, did Entercon ever receive the list of information requested in the city's comments on the PSP, and did they make any attempt to determine whether that requested information was available? It's Rachel, I think I could answer this. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, we used the study plan from FERC to uh, base what our, uh, what our data inputs were. And to be specific, they're listed in the report at the end. We've got uh, references from uh, several sources. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just we followed the, the study plan. Understood. And, and, and in the revised study plan, again, just as I noted, you, you did say that you would look into whether the information, you would look into the information requested by the city to the extent it was available. So. I was just trying to determine if that specific list of information that was requested was something you worked off in looking into available information or whether that was not something that was considered by Anarchon and putting together the study report. No, I think uh, uh, I'd probably better uh, put that question down in, in, uh, in <laughs> Probably just write that question down because uh, I think there's a more complex answer than you should probably address here. So, Shannon, I'm not sure if you could hear Jerry, but we're just requesting you provide that question in writing. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Shannon? Or, sorry, it looks like you've been raised your hand. So, Walker? Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry, my headset died, so I'm just on speakerphone at the moment. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, it's very clear. Okay, great. Um, Rachel, is it possible for you to go back to your last the slide with your conclusions? Uh, yes, for moment, please. Are you, are you looking for this slide, sir? I'm sorry? Is this the slide you're looking for, sir? I'm not seeing any slides. <laughs> Nothing showing on our end, okay. All right, let me try it one more time. Sorry. <clears throat> there we go. Yeah, that one. So I noticed your, your, the, the last sentence there, the conclusion is the continued operations are anticipated to have no adverse socioeconomic impact. But I, the previous discussion wasn't entirely clear, but I think I understood that you all didn't look at negative impacts. So it sort of seems like you're concluding there's none of what you didn't look for. Am I misunderstanding something? Well, I don't, I don't know that I understand the question well enough. Um, I, I when you say we didn't look at negative impacts, uh, what do you mean by negative impacts, sir? Well, any, any negative economic impacts from the project, right? I mean, I think Shannon's question was quite general in that regard. I think Chuck was resistant to answering, which I took to mean that 
because, uh, which I took to mean that you hadn't looked at any negative impacts. So did you look at any negative impact? Be clear, uh, and, and Whopper, I really don't appreciate you putting words into my mouth. The question was well, whether you looked at any negative impacts. Yeah, well, um, I can maybe speak a little slowly. Uh, we were asked to look at a, a four-county region. We were not asked to look at any particular area. And that approach to a socioeconomic study is consistent with what FERC requires of other FERC licenses. I think you also heard yesterday the, the conclusions of some very technical studies about the effects of the project related to upstream flooding. So, yes, I think that, that if there are negative socioeconomic effects that are attributable to the project in the study area, we looked at that. Does that answer your question? I'm just trying to, I think I may repeat that back to you so to hopefully avoid putting words in your mouth. You're saying if there are negative impacts, negative socioeconomic impacts in the study area, you looked at them. Yes. And did you? Were there? Did you read the report? My understanding of this meeting is it's about trying to clarify and work through the details of these reports. Yeah, and and I mean, I'm most asking... of what we've discussed is stuff that's covered in the reports, but yet we're discussing them. Yeah, and you're asking the questions. Yeah. So I'm asking and you, you're did you read the them. report? <laughs> no, no, that's not true either. Did you read the report? Okay. Well, I think my understanding of the, the basis of Shannon's question is it didn't look like there was analysis of negative impacts in the report. And she was trying to confirm her understanding that that's what the study did and didn't do. I think that what we did is exactly what the commission asked us to do. We were asked to look at a number of different data sets and information, gathering socioeconomic information in the four county area. We did that. We summarized all of that socioeconomic information into our study report, whether good or bad or indifferent. If you're satisfied that that study supports this conclusion, then I think we can move on. We wouldn't have put it in the slide if we didn't think that way. Okay. Thank you. It looks like Shannon, you've raised your hand one more time. Any other thoughts from you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess just Given that we've established that, or that you've said that negative impacts were considered in putting together the study, um, and we have gone through the study report and discussed its contents here in this meeting, as is the intent, um, I, I was wondering, could you could you put, point possibly to where exactly in the study report you're discussing those negative impacts? Again, I, I, my understanding is that the, the purpose of this meeting is to, to discuss what you presented in the reports and analyze that as needed, ask questions. So my, my question is just, you know, for my, for my own understanding and the understanding of everyone in attendance at this meeting, is there a specific place that you're referencing when you say that you look at those negative impacts? Look at the appendices to the report, please. The data is all there. Right, so it's just, again, for my own understanding to make sure I'm 
I'm tracking with what you're pointing me to. You're, you're saying that the analysis of negative impacts is covered in your general overview of the data considered? You know, Shannon, you know, this is, this is getting, and, you know, this is getting ridiculous. Um, so you are welcome to look at the appendices. You're welcome to look at the report. And you're welcome to submit questions to us on the record in writing if you feel as though we did not fulfill the first study plan obligations. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, we, we certainly will. I'm, I'm still not sure that uh, I am seeing exactly what you're pointing to, but, you know, we will follow up as needed. Okay. I believe uh, oh, we have a question from Me Too with FERC. Hi guys, not a question, but just a general statement. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to review the results of the initial study report and what's been filed to date, but I'm just going to ask that everyone try to be as specific as possible with their questions, but also, you know, folks on either end to please be respectful. Um, I, I think we can do this in a much more productive manner if we just you know, are a little bit more transparent and open and respectful of one another and each other's questions. So this is GMA's meeting. It isn't FERC's meeting, but that's just my request. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If there is uh, no further questions or comments, I do not see any other hands raised or anything in the Q&A. Uh, we will conclude socioeconomics and uh, meet back at 1 o'clock with aquatics. Uh, just a reminder, if you do, uh, please do not disconnect the meeting or you might have to re-register and you'll have trouble reconnecting for this afternoon. So if you'll just uh, stay on the meeting, that would be much appreciated. We will see you back at 1 o'clock. Thank you. All right, guys, welcome back from lunch. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here in just a few seconds. We'll wait till 1 o'clock, give everybody a chance to get settled. Um, we'll be starting with the aquatic species of concern with the paddlefish sub subsidy. Then we'll move into rare and aquatic species and then wetland and terrestrial. After that, um, depending on what time, we might take a short break, and then we'll load um, the cultural resources study for the public summary and likely be ending earlier than planned today. Again, if you have any issues with audio or um, seeing anything, just shoot us a Q&A in the chat um, or an email. So with that, I will turn it over to Brad. OK, thank you, Jacqueline. I'm Brad Littrell with BioWest, and um, we uh, were in charge of the paddlefish substudy, which is one component of the aquatic species of concern study. The other components will be covered later. Uh, to get started, I just wanted to provide a little background on paddlefish, otherwise known as spoonbill. Um, a lot of folks from the area may be familiar with them, but they're native to large rivers of eastern Oklahoma. They support a prominent snag fishery in Grand Lake and its tributaries. Uh, in fact, paddlefish angling has an estimated economic impact of $18.2 million on the Oklahoma economy. Uh, Grand Lake is a prominent fishery, um, so it makes up a large portion of that. And as a result, uh, Oklahoma Department of Wildlife has established Paddlefish Research Center on the banks of Grand Lake. Um, paddlefish uh, are planktivores, so they inhabit deep, slow-moving water in large rivers and lakes, uh, and they use electrical receptors on their rostrum 
are on their paddle to assist in detecting zooplankton, which is their main food source. That food is filtered from the water using specialized gill rakers. Um, and since they feed on plankton, they don't, uh, they don't bite a, a traditional bait or lure. And so, but they do have large spawning aggregations in the spring in tributary rivers. And this provides an opportunity for snag anglers to, uh, to catch paddlefish. Powerfish spawning uh, occurs, like I said, in large groups over hard substrates and river environments. Uh, depending on latitude, the timing fluctuates, but it's generally in the spring in Oklahoma. Uh, spawning peaks in late March and early April. Spawning is episodic, so it's not necessarily annual in all populations. Uh, and it's strongly tied to springtime pulse events. Uh, initiated by rising water levels and usually occurs during these extended high flow events that happen in the spring. Uh, paddlefish spawn uh, demersal eggs, so they sink to the bottom and adhere to the substrate. And hard substrates such as gravel and cobble are considered key to spawning success because eggs that fall on sand or silt may have reduced survival. Uh, before I get into the paddlefish substudy, I wanted to cover some of the previous research that's been done on Grand Lake paddlefish populations. Uh, and this is really focused in three main areas. The first area is uh, recruitment trends. What factors uh, influence recruitment of paddlefish? And so to look at this, um, studies of aged paddlefish and examined annual recruitment in relation to environmental conditions. And I'll show some data from the 2009 stock assessment. Uh, the second uh, research topic that's been covered is spawning habitat. Uh, as I said, hard substrates are presumed to be critical to spawning success. And so by uh, quantifying the amount of hard substrate, which is inundated under various flow levels, we can estimate spawning habitat. And that's, uh, this has been done by Schooley and O'Donnell in 2016. And we'll talk more about that study later. And then the third topic that's been researched is where is, where is paddlefish recruitment occurring in this system? And studies have used uh, dentary bone microchemistry to identify which, uh, which river the paddlefish were spawned in. And again, we'll, we, we'll get into the details of that. So here's some data from the 2009 uh, stock assessment. And uh, the key thing to notice in this graph is that uh, at the nine-year-old year class, you see a strong, uh, uh, strong number of paddlefish in that nine-year-old year class, both male and female. And this is data from the 2008 harvest. And so those fish um, were spawned in 1999. And when we look at 1999, it's circled in the red there, we have a high number of days over 10,000 CFS in the Spring River and over four, and we have about 40 days over 15,000 CFS in the Neosho River. So these high flow uh, spring time events uh, are critical to paddlefish spawning success. Um, the next study is the Schooley O'Donnell and O'Donnell study from 2016. Uh, so they used uh, consumer-grade sonar to map hard substrates in the spring of the Neosho rivers. And they distinguished, they used this to distinguish between soft substrates such, such as silk and hard substrates such as gravel and cobble and bedrock. And then they estimated the spawning habitat over a range of river stages and used predictive models to estimate proportional habitat availability under different fr flow conditions. And as you can see in the graph on the right, the Neosho River actually provides more proportional spawning habitat under similar flow levels. Uh, the Neosho also has a bigger watershed, so those, those flow levels occur more often in the Neosho River, and therefore it has greater value to paddlefish spawning recruitment than does the Spring River. Um, 
And then the other study that I mentioned previously was Whitledge and Spewley 2019. Because there are geologic differences in the Neosho and Spring River watersheds, uh, there are strontium calcium, there are differences in the strontium calcium ratios within those watersheds. And so this study actually analyzed uh, strontium calcium ratios from the center of the dentary bone. So that's the portion of the bone that's laid down early in the paddlefish's life. And they use this to infer natal river. So the 775 paddlefish that were analyzed from three different year classes, 87% of those were identified as being of Neosho River origin. Less than 10% of those in all three year classes were from Spring River origin. So uh, the conclusion there is that, again, most recruitment is happening in the Neosho River. So to summarize the previous research, year class recruitment is variable, strongly tied to high springtime flows. Uh, based on spawning substrates, the Neosho River uh, demonstrates greater habitat availability at lower river stages and therefore has greater value. And then uh, the dentary bone studies suggest that Neosho River recruits dominate the Grand Lake paddlefish population. So that brings us to the current study, uh, paddlefish substudy. <coughs> And the purpose of this was to estimate the area of paddlefish spawning substrate affected by project operations and the corresponding effect on paddlefish recruitment. To do this, we, uh, we collected data or we, uh, we retrieved the data from the Schooley and O'Donnell study uh, and mapped that in GIS. Uh, so we we took spatially explicit depth and hardness data from the previous study, compiled that, formatted it for use in GIS, and then we generated maps of paddlefish spawning habitat within the project boundary. Uh, and then once that was done, we quantified the amount of suitable spawning substrate within the boundary in each river system. Uh, these maps demonstrate what that data looks like. The map on the left is the Neosho River upstream of Miami, Oklahoma. Uh, paddlefish uh, spawning habitat is identified in red. The yellow line that you see is the project boundary. And so as you can see upstream of Miami, uh, the river is dominated by hard substrates <laughs> suitable for paddlefish spawning. The, uh, the Figure on the right is the Neosho below Miami, Oklahoma. And you can see here um, much less hard substrate in that portion of the river. And then here's the uh, here's what that data looks like in the Spring River. Again, as you move upstream in the Spring River from the from the confluence, you'll see a uh, increase in the amount of suitable spawning substrates in the upper portions of the basin. When we quantified that, uh, this table kind of summarizes the, uh, the data. Uh, the first row that you see there, study area. So that refers to the Schooley and O'Donnell study area. They mapped everything from Grand Lake up to the first major migration barrier. And this was uh, 1,444 acres of habitat within the Neosho River. Of that, 997 acres were identified as suitable paddlefish spawning substrate. When we overlay the project boundary, uh, 696 acres of that occur within the project. And that's about 70% of the available spawning substrate within the Neosho River. And you see a similar percentage for the Spring River and overall. So in conclusion, uh, approximately 70% of paddlefish spawning substrate in each river occurs within the project boundary. Uh, paddlefish spawning substrate increases in upstream areas, which are minimally impacted by project operations at high inflow conditions. 
when pile fish are spawning. Uh, the river reservoir interface below the spring in the Ocho is, is kind of used as a staging area to, where the fish wait for these high flow pulses to begin their upstream spawning migrations. Previous research suggests that paddlefish recruitment is, is strongly tied to hydrology and is best in years with extended high flow conditions during the spring spawning period. And this is particularly important in the Neosho River as that's where most of the recruits come from. And so occurrence of such high flow events have a much greater influence on paddlefish recruitment than reservoir levels. And uh, no additional analysis is proposed as uh, a component of the paddlefish substudy. And I believe that is my last slide. With, with that, uh, we can have some time for questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Um, it looks like Walker Sanofsky has a question. Walker? Yes, hello, thank you. So I'm looking at the initial study report, the cover report for all of the, you know, sub-reports. Um, and it says that the H&H &H study has demonstrated, in, in the context of paddlefish, it says the H&H &H study has demonstrated project operation. Initial stage at Pensacola Dam has an immaterial impact on upstream water surface elevations and consequently the hydraulic conditions which paddlefish seek at upstream spawning sites during high inflow conditions. So from the point of view of, of paddlefish resources, how would you know if, uh, if a flood impact or an impact of project operation is material? Uh, so I think the uh, I think that statement you're referencing is is uh, based on some of the H and H modeling that was done that showed that um, minimal impacts on that initial that initial reservoir stage during these major inflow events. And so if uh, if there is minimal impact there. And those are the events that these paddlefish are using to spawn, and we would assume minimal impact on on paddlefish spawning. Well, I guess as best I could understand from Jesse's presentation on that study, he was, you know, when he used the phrase immaterial impact, that was uh, sort of from the <clears throat> hydrologist's perspective. It was a notion of that impact, such as it was, was, uh, you know, he was repeatedly saying an order of magnitude smaller than the differences between floods from a, you know, a more modest to a larger flood. But uh, that doesn't, you know, how, how much bigger a different flow event might be doesn't seem like it would inform whether a given difference due to project operations would affect paddlefish. Uh, this is Sean. Um, what it really comes down to uh, in this is these are not shallow water spawning fishes. Um, they prefer deeper water, but they need the rapid inflow to successfully spawn. And um, therefore, um, the success of, uh, through this additional research that we did in this initial study period, we found that there's a great, great influence on the success of of paddlefish spawning due to the uh, recurrence or the duration of high inflow events. And it's obvious to me that the operation or the reservoir elevation at the dam does not control what water comes into the reservoir down the Neosho River before it reaches the reservoir or the Spring River. So that's what that's based upon. Okay, a couple of follow-ups then. First is you mentioned that duration of those events was important for paddlefish, but I thought we heard in the H and H study discussion that uh, y'all didn't analyze duration. So is that right? I think you're missing my point here. Um, the first of all, we're not showing that this paddlefish is unhealthy. Uh, we did the additional research here 
to look at what affects the success of spawning of paddlefish. And we found that the, what Mother Nature provides coming into the reservoir has the greatest effect on the success of the spawning. These are deep water spawning fish. They'll spawn into depths of eight or so feet of water, but they need the trigger of the high quick inflows coming in, the quantity of water coming in to trigger them to move upstream to spawn successfully. And they seem to do better, have better success at spawning when these, um, these inflow events provided by Mother Nature are, are of long duration. So okay, it's, and that it's was really good. taking it to the next step that it's immaterial, to use a word that we've used before, um, what elevation the dam has the water. It's really what the inflow event is. And that is not caused by the operation of the project. All right, and just to clarify, that was Sean talking. Is that Sean who was yes. on the H and H team? No, I'm not on the H and H team. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you remind me what your role is? I'm the uh, FERC relicensing process person. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'm sorry, I missed the name of the gentleman doing the aquatic species report here. But just to confirm, would you agree with what Sean said, or anything to add to that, as a biologist? I think he summarized it well. All right, and then my one other follow-up is, uh, you know, since it sounds like, uh, you know, it's the, it's the, the high flow. Is it high flows in terms of the water depth or the velocity that they're responding to? Uh, I I would suggest that it's both, right? It's uh, it's the it's probably the increase in depth that uh, initially triggers that response to move upstream. But once they move upstream, they're looking for these flowing water habitats over hard gravel sub gravel and cobble substrates. All right, and. So in that regard, I mean, we talked in the H and H study how mostly their uh, conclusions were based on the maximum water surface elevations. I'm wondering if uh, you did anything to look at whether the dam operations affect that velocity component during those high flow events. You know, where it's located, how it overlaps with the habitat. Uh. That, you know, again, we were following um, the study plan as outlined, um, and that was not a, velocity was not a component of that. Um, so for this, for this sub-study, we did not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Walker, do you have anything else? If not, but you want to raise your hand. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Sorry. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Brad related to paddlefish before we move on to the next area? Okay. Uh, Adam Peer with Burke, I believe. Adam, yeah, correct me if I'm not right. Okay. <laughs> no, that, that's correct. I'm with Ferg. Um, yeah, just sort of a follow-up on some of the discussion that we've already had. So it seems what we're saying here is that the, the flow events that were included in the upstream hydraulic model, those flows are representative of the types of flows that typically occur or the types of things that would trigger spawning events. Is that, is that the case? I think that's a fair assessment. Okay. Now, I, I mean, in general, what would you say that those are right. sort of, those are those are peak events that were looked at in the in the uh, upstream hydraulic model? Um, so, do does spawning occur at lower flows than than was represented in those hydraulic models?
So yes, those uh, those high flow events in the model were, uh, you know, again those those large events. If, you, if I go back to my uh, previous graph here, with that looked at paddlefish recruitment, it's those large events that are uh, triggering paddlefish spawning success. Okay. And is there some, do you have an idea just in terms of the range of flow um, that we're talking about? I mean, it, that's, that's triggering these events? Well, in, in, in this, in this example, uh, we're, you know, the, the number of events over 10,000 in the spring and over 15,000 in the Neosho is what's quantified here. I can't speak to what was done in the H&H &H modeling, but maybe somebody else can. Okay. So this is Jesse Petrowski for the H&H &H modeling. This is why we looked at a large, broad variety of inflow events ranging from one year up to 100 year. And I believe, you know, um, Di Thomas asked, asked us a question um, the other day, and we had some confusion on stage versus flow. But the result of that discussion that we had was that there was no issue that the city of Miami had with the, you know, with the range of flows that were being looked at in the H&H &H study because we covered everything from a one-year event to a 100-year event. So uh, I, think, I think that's probably a settled issue at this point. Right, that, that's fine. No, I just wanted to get get some perspective on how how representative it is of, with respect to paddlefish. Um, I think you've answered my question. Um, and just a second question. Um, I know it's not in your report, uh, but do you have any information um, that, to be able to analyze how the Wentic and Lonic habitat would increase or decrease as a result of project operation? So if that question is directed at me, that's going to be something that we're looking at in the second study period. Okay. And is that, is that the case regarding um, paddlefish habitat as well? Well, given that... Uh, Go back to my conclusion slide here. Uh, given that these these strong flow events are seem to be the driver of paddlefish spawning success, um, we're not, there's no additional analysis proposed as part of the paddlefish substudy. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Adam. If you'll just raise your hand for me, so I don't get confused. And then we have um, one other question from Kevin Stubbs with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, to sort of add to, you know, Adam's question, you know, to me, what seems to be relatively important is the duration of those higher flows and certainly when you get those big peak events you you do have a relatively long duration of those you know higher flows but you know 10 to 15,000 CFS is not anything really exceptional you know for the New Hampshire River it's just in some years you get you get those kinds of flows you know for a long period of time associated with a big peak flood event. And then occasionally you get years where, you know, you don't get those huge, you know, flood events, but you can get significant periodic rains that would still give you, you know, extended time periods with flows over 15,000 CFS. And those kinds of flow events are not necessarily being measured in those peak, you know, flooding events. That's all I have.
Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from? Okay. All right. Well, if there are no other comments or questions, uh, Brad, we will move. I'm going to switch presentations and we'll move into the rare and aquatic species. <coughs> I'm Buck Ray, I'm Biologist with Olson, and Olson, as a part of the... Speak up just a little bit. <laughs> as, as a part of the, um, the study, Olson was uh, tasked with looking at some of the additional species of concern, uh, primarily the, the listed species, <clears throat> and doing a, a data review of existing data that was available, and then using that to help direct um, recommendation for studies from uh, for year two that will occur next year. <clears throat> so the species of concern that we looked at that were identified included the Neosho mucket, the rabbit's foot, and the wing maple leaf, uh, which are three mussels, and then two fish species, the Neosho mad tom and the Neosho smallmouth bass. So I'm going to talk about each of those uh, specifically in a minute. So the study area that we looked at um, was Grand Lake, with, which occurs in Craig, Maysdale, and Iowa counties, um, and the area that corresponds with the h, &H study, um, which um, has already been discussed. Um, the study area for what we were looking at extends upstream from Pensacola Dam within the Neosho River to approximately three miles from the Kansas State Line, within the Spring River um, up to six and a half miles of the Kansas State Line and then in Elk River upstream to the Missouri uh, uh, State uh, Line. <coughs> Again, it was dictated by the model. Um, as well as uh, portions of Tar Creek um, below um, or upstream uh, of the gauge station at uh, uh, the 32nd Avenue Bridge, and then the associated basin coves that are, are within the, the lake itself, another river port itself. So the first species we looked at was the Neosho mucket. Uh, the Neosho mucket um, is currently found within the elk uh, spring, or was historically found within the elk spring and elk rivers uh, within the that occur within the study area. Uh, it was historically observed in uh, 17 streams within the Neosho, Illinois, and Verdigre River basin. Uh, it's found in shallow ripples and runs in areas that have uh, moderate to still flowing water. Um, it may also occur in backwater habitats. Um, you know, some recent data has found them in some backwater, slackwater ha habitats, but uh, those that have occurred, those records in Oklahoma, um, are outside of the study area and the watershed. Um, it does spawn in April and May. Um, the female brood the glochidium through August, and then it uses glochidium hosts of multiple bass species um, to, um, as part of their life cycle. This species was listed as endangered in 2013, wherever it was found across its range. There is critical habitat within the Elk River in Oklahoma, um, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later. It's been shown to be declining within the Osho River with the last observation in 2014, um, but maybe uh, stable in the spring Elk Rivers with the last observation in 2017. So the known uh, locations, uh, looking at the historical data and data that was provided, um, all of them, uh, with the exception of one work, are down outside of the study area, uh, south of, the, of uh, where we were, uh, well, south of the study area. So, so looking at the summary of the, of the data that was found, um, recent studies um, did not find any relic or live better listed mussels of any species uh, within the project extent. Um, historic, 
facilities uh, within the Spring River um, have also not found anything, uh, any of the state listed or state or federal listed species. <clears throat> we did identify that there was no presence or absence of data within the Elk River uh, within the portions of the GRDA project boundary. Uh, the five year review suggested that there may be um, an extent or existing population within that area. Um, and there was also one record of a new that was found during a construction project um, in 2014. Uh, so, based on these data, um, it's a recommendation that at this time that multiple surveys be conducted within the Elk River. Uh, within that portion of the critical habitat that is within the study area from the confluence of Buffalo Creek upstream to the Missouri State Line. So the next species we looked at was the rabbit's foot mussel. Uh, this species is found in the Verdigree, Illinois, and Lower River basins. Um, the historic tree in the, in the Verdigree, Neosha Spring, Illinois, um, blue and lower rivers within Oklahoma. It is found in rivers that have moderate current and clear shallow water and sand and gravel some straits. <coughs> it often travels um, out to the edge of pools and um, uh, within the river in the, sh the shallower edge edges of those, those habitat. Uh, it spawns in May and June and uses a whole host of um, hosts, a whole suite of shiners um, as a part of its life cycle. So this species of mussel was also um, listed as endangered in 2013, wherever it was found. Uh, there is critical habitat for this species identified within the Spring River um, within Missouri and also within the Neosha River within Kansas. Um, but both of those are uh, quite a ways upstream from the study area. So looking at the, the data that was collected, um, as was the case with the other mussel species, um, no live mussels or relic mussels were found during the most recent study in 2017. Uh, Surveys within the Spring River um, also did not find uh, any uh, live mussels. Uh, and there's no occurrence data for this species within the project boundary. Uh, the closest critical habitat is 25 miles upstream, up, upstream uh, in Jasper County, Missouri on, on the Spring River. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's been no live mussels uh, specimens found within the Oklahoma segment of the river during the most recent surveys. Uh, and the five-year review uh, acknowledges that the Oklahoma segment of the river, um, that it's historic range, and that it does not have any current populations. Uh, so based on those data, uh, the recommendation for the species is that there's no additional studies, with the exception of um, looking for all mussel species as we're doing the study within the Elk River. The next muscle we looked at was the winged maple leaf. Um, it occurs within Oklahoma and is currently found only in the Little River. Uh, it was historically found in the Boggy, Kaimichi, Neosho, and Little Rivers of Oklahoma. It's found in streams that have relatively high water quality and sand and gravel, gravel substrate, and often is in dense muscle beds with other muscle species, uh, which is common with a lot of the quadrilateral muscles. Uh, it is a fall short term brooder. And its coquitial hosts are uh, catfish, um, with primarily the, the channel catfish and the blue catfish. This species uh, was listed as endangered in 1991, where it was found, um, and there aren't any critical habitats um, currently identified for this species. So looking at the summary of the data, um, again, as the case with the other mussel species, the most recent studies did not find any listed mussels uh, within the project area um, or within the Spring River. Uh, the Sam Noble Museum, Oklahoma State Invertebrate Collection, um, and ODWC have indicated that there's no specimens uh, that have been previously found within the Neosha Spring or Elk Rivers or, or drainage surrounding the, where the reservoir. Uh, and the only recognized population that currently occurs in Oklahoma is within the Little River, which is 175 miles uh, from the city area. So based on these data, um, there's no additional 
recommendation for surveys for this species. So moving on to the fish. Uh, the first fish we looked at was the Neoshematom. Uh, Neoshematom is a relatively small uh, catfish species. It's native to the Illinois River, Neosho River, Cottonwood Creek, and Spring River in Oklahoma. Uh, it has an existing population uh, that is restricted to the Neosho River upstream of Grand Lake. It's found in ripples and gravel bars and loose gravel uh, in moderate to high velocities uh, at shallow depths. Uh, this species was listed as threatened in 1990, um, and there is no critical habitat currently recent for this species. So looking at the data um, from uh, locality for the species, uh, the Water Resources Board um, has collected um, a lot of data, um, but all of the species occurrence for this species um, are within the Neosha River, with most of them occurring, occurring upstream of the study area. So this species uh, has been found within drainages within the study, uh, going back to uh, the late 60s. Um, 2016 is the last known survey near the project area conducted by the Water Board, um, and 2007 is the last known um, survey that identified it within the study area. So based on these data um, and the fact that the Water Board's survey methodologies did not always focus um, strictly on the species, um, it's recommended that some targeted sampling be done within a 20-mile stretch of the Neosha River from Highway 60 up to the Craig Ottawa County line um, in locations uh, that are um, ideal habitat for the species. And then the last species we looked at was the Neosha smallmouth bass. Uh, the Neosha smallmouth bass is native to the western extent of the Ozark Highland ecoregion and has been known to occur in um, multiple watersheds. It's found in streams that have watersheds with coarse texture soils. Uh, it constructs its nests in fine sediment substrates and low water. And it is a, a, a littoral species and is typically not found within um, reservoirs. It's in streams and rivers. Uh, it is not a federally or state listed species, but it is identified by uh, Oklahoma Department of Wildlife as a species of concern. Um, the uh, part of the reason for the listing was that conservation of the species would provide a, a diverse portfolio, uh, meaning that um, by protecting the species, there's a greater amount of genetic diversity uh, that can help it thrive and, um, and, and make it through future climate change or other habitat related stressors that may occur. And since it's not federally or state listed, there's no critical habitat identified. So looking at the known locations of the species, um, there have been several uh, surveys that have uh, documented the species presence. Uh, most of them are uh, within the Spring River um, upstream of the project area, other, although there are a few farther, farther south within the study area itself. And we'll, I'll mention those in just a minute. So looking at the, the summary of the data, uh, so the records show that the small population um, is present within some of the drainages of the study area. Um, it was identified as a genetically distinct uh, subspecies of smallmouth bass, um, which um, part of the issue looking at some of the data going back were that a lot of the historical data just lumped all of the smallmouth bass into a single data set. Um, and so um, we could not tease apart whether or not smallmouth bass were a part of those separate from the lake stream. Um, it is known to occur in multiple um, watersheds as a result of um, a lot of work that was done by um, Dr. Brewer. Um, the smallmouth bass uh, from the Water Board and the same Noble Museum uh, were found within the study area, but based on conversations with ODWC, um, 
it was determined that these are probably not likely to be Neosho stream, uh, smallmouth bass, um, and they're probably lake stream. Uh, in addition to that, um, ODWTC has done a significant amount of sampling within the watershed, and during that time, um, they did not detect any Neosho subspecies. Um, so based on that, um, uh, it's unlikely to occur within uh, the study area, and we have no additional uh, study recommendations at this time for this species. Uh, we have a question. Yes. Uh, Josh Johnson with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Do you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Carry on. Hey, Buck. Hey. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make clear that I think maybe there was some cross uh, connections there. It, it sounds like in the report, when I read the report, and it sounds like here that ODWC is saying that within the project area and surrounding drainages, Neosho smallmouth bass don't exist. And that's just couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, we could tell, I could name five watersheds, right? There. I mean, creeks that run in right there, you know, these ones that you, you've said here, Sycamore Creek, uh, part of the Elk River, Buffalo Creek, Lost Creek, we could go on. I mean, there's a bunch of them in Andrew Taylor's 2018 paper, and that's all legit stuff. I think what you got, though, was they haven't been sampled within the lake. So anything within the reservoir, yeah, we don't expect to be a Neosho strain, possibly a cross or something that gets blown down into the reservoir, but I don't think we expect that. But the report specifically says and surrounding drainages, and that's just not. I think we all, I don't think you would argue with this fact that that's not true. Right. Yeah, so the information in the report was based on the comments that we got back. And if, there, if there's some additional data, like, like I would encourage you to put that in writing and send it just so that can be corrected. Yeah, I absolutely will. I, th I think what Trevor got was a question showing the study area, and I don't I don't know how that got messed up, but I think they were talking about the reservoir, and obviously we have to force the thought that they're not in surrounding granite. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jeff Hoffman with Oklahoma Department of Conservation. Okay. Uh, Kevin Stubbs, it looks like you have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I apologize. I lost internet connection during part of this um and uh we we back on the, the muscles anyway um we we do recommend some additional you know surveys um for those listed muscles in the in the spring and um and neosho river as well some of those areas were not sampled that that heavily and we have some ongoing or proposed surveys that will be going on and what we're suggesting is some additional surveys be done sort of in addition to those to add some additional areas to be surveyed because there certainly are um, like neosho markets identified not very far upstream from your project boundary. All right. Yeah, so if you can um, put that in, in writing with, with what, what you're requesting to be done, um, as well as any additional information on other studies that, that you are alluding to and send them over, uh, we'll definitely uh, look at that. Anything further, Kevin? Um, have you covered? I, I have uh, a follow-up. Okay. Yeah, Kevin, um, just just to make sure that I understand your your comment, um, GRDA is proposing some additional work um, for uh, one of the mussel species and one of the the fish species. And is is your comment saying that uh, you expect to uh, recommend studies in addition to what GRDA has proposed in the reports that went out a couple weeks ago? Yes, 
uh, like for the mussels, you were only proposing to survey the Elk River, and uh, and then there's there's some for the Neosho Med Tom. There's some statements in there about how they're not essentially implying that they aren't in the Spring River anymore, and and uh, we are not in agreement with that. Um, I collected one myself in 2005 within the project boundary. Um, so we think additional surveys for Neosho Mad Toms are warranted. Plus, you got to factor in that you're asking for a, a license that's going to cover at least a 30-year time period. And supposedly these, you know, heavy metals uh, contaminants issues will be hopefully getting better at least during that time period. And even if they aren't there, we're going to be trying to uh, them there to recover these, these species over their life period. So I, I appreciate the understand the, uh, the clarification because you said that you were offline there for a couple minutes and I just wanted to make sure that we were uh, understanding your comment in context to what we had said that we proposed. So uh, we look forward to getting those uh, written uh, comments from you in terms of uh, what the Fish and Wildlife Service would like to do in terms of uh, our studies over the next year. Yeah, and it, and it should be part of your, you know, in addition to compliance with the Federal Power Act, you know, FERC has to comply with the Endangered Species Act, and so it, it should be part of your your consultation, you know, package, uh, whether it's FERC or FERC combined with the Corps of Engineers if you're, you know, dealing with potential you know, flood impacts. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Anything further? Before I move to the next question? Uh, that's, that's it for now. Okay. Uh, Walker, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Yeah, I noticed that your presentation and, and also the report uh, at least briefly touched on climate change impacts, uh, but I hadn't seen that in the study plan. So I just wondered if you could touch on why you would look at that and uh, any, any comments on, you know, the appropriateness of thinking about climate change in the context of this relicensing. Yeah, so the, the study that we did was focused on the study plan that was approved by, by, by FERC and didn't specifically address climate change. I, I think the references to the climate change were either from like the five-year review from the Fish and Wildlife Service or from some other reference, but that was what they identified as something that could be imperiling some of these species. Um, so it wasn't something we specifically looked at. It was probably from, um, and I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but I'm, I'm assuming it was from one of those other sources. Uh, is referencing a US FWS 2018 study, but I also I noticed the phrase on one of your slides, but it went by quickly, so I, I don't remember exactly right. the context there. Yeah, I'm, 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 that was the five-year review, um, and so that that's something the Fish and Wildlife Service looks at as a part of their their process. Okay, so just to clarify, if the study plan doesn't say climate change, neither does your report. It doesn't look at it. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, looks like we have one last question from Josh Johnson again with the Department of Wildlife. Josh? Yeah. Um, real quick, just wanted to, not a question, just wanted to support Kevin comment about Neosho Mad Tom and the Spring River. I will have to look for it and I'll try to put it in the uh, comments that we filed. But I'm quite sure we have uh, a collection of records from summer of 2021 in the Spring River. So let me uh, let me try to find that and get in that filing. But I just wanted to put that on the record that, that they do exist. 
Spring River as far yeah. as we, we can tell. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Josh. And if you and Kevin have additional survey data um, that hasn't been provided, please provide it to us. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, or Kevin and Josh and Walker. Any other questions from the attendees? <clears throat> okay, so we're just going to move on to uh, wetland and terrestrial. So let me pull up that PowerPoint. Oh, you had one more. Yeah, slide. I'm it, sorry. I thought you got. It's just it's just the summary. Oh, slide, so. Okay. We, we got <laughs> sorry about that. rainwater with horizon and we okay. did the terrestrial species of concern study for the, uh, for the Pensacola hydroelectric project um, with Dr. Martin as well for the uh, the um, great app. For study period one we conducted a American Marion beetle presence absence survey the federally threatened species. We set out six traps six of the pitfall traps um, across all suitable habitat types. And the presence absence survey ran from July 18th to July 23rd. There were um, valid weather parameters throughout the course of the survey, and no American bearing units were found during the course of the survey. We selected where we were going to put the traps based on the, um, the h and H model. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The, um, the upstream model extends because they're terrestrial species and we needed to look at the larger areas of um, landscape covering the um, all suitable habitat types, the native mixed grasses, the forested areas, the mosaic habitat areas. I spoke with Kevin Stubbs, showed him a proposed map, and we made sure that everyone was in agreement that these six areas sufficiently covered the project area. Um, the H&H &H model has indicated that the project operation effects are now limited to the project boundary rather than the upstream model since used for the 2021 survey. So in this picture, you can see the blue trap. The blue circle um, indicates the trap that was done this year, one of the traps that was done this year, and it was negative. We placed it so it would cover all of that land within the upstream model extents, the red boundary there. And now what we need to look at is to see if the ABBs are located within that smaller um, project boundary, the pink line. So the revised study plan calls for two years of presence absence surveys, and the traps have a half-mile effective radius, and they're imprecise. We can't just survey the project area. ABBs have been recorded to move approximately 10 kilometers in six nights. And there's no way to say that a beetle captured in the hypothetical yellow trap there has been occupying or using that area rather than being lured in from a further distance of a more suitable habitat. Therefore, uh, GRDA proposes to forego this, the second study period survey as the results might not accurately represent potential project effects. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Martin to discuss the gray back. Thank you. There's a, a lot of historical data on the gray back uh, in eastern Oklahoma that's not necessarily, along, necessarily on this slide, but I think I can give us a quick tutorial of, of the presence of the gray bat in eastern Oklahoma. It's, it's a bat that is unique in that it is uh, isolated or what we call a cave obligate species. So it's found only in caves. It's not found in, um, it doesn't roost in forests or trees or places like that. It is strictly an obligate uh, cave dwelling species, which means it's limited to karst producing or cave producing uh, geology in the southeastern part of the United States. Basically, 
Um, these caves that we find in the Grand Lake region or the Grand River region are the western extension of the range uh, for the gray bat. The gray bat stays in what we call maternity colonies in the summertime where they raise young. They stay in hibernacula in the wintertime where they go into torpor and survive the winter. The caves that we have in Oklahoma are maternity caves where they have their young, raise their young, their young become volant, they feed, and then they migrate out back to other caves and hibernacula caves in about November. There's a cave here uh, in the Grand River drainage or Grand, Grand Lake Reservoir drainage that historically we've had data on for about the last 45, 50 years. It is a cave that we call DL2, DL stands for Delaware County, Oklahoma. The entrance to the cave is at about 752 elevation. It does house a maternity colony of gray bats numbering about 18,000, 15 to 18,000. That's in the peak and that's after the young become bullet and are visible. So about 15,000 to 18,000 gray bats annually. This past year, we estimated the colony to be within that range. It is an entrance to the cave that is naturally uh, occurs, like we say here, about 70, 752 feet elevation. That elevation is falls within excessive or high water records of high water events of Grand Lake. In the graph here on table one, you can see some of those events or all of those events that have occurred in about the last 10 years, two in 2011 and then 2015, 17 and 19. Odd number of years seem like really bad years for some reason. But you can see the elevations, the maximum elevations. These were taken off the GRDA elevation uh, data online. You can see the duration of days that it was at that elevation where the passage or the entrance to this cave was inundated. Each time we can validate that the colony successfully vacated the site because there is an adjacent cave that works in tandem with this colony located about two miles away and so we can simultaneously monitor that alternative cave location. That way we know that the colony did successfully vacate this cave at DL2, DL2 what we call Beaver Dam Cave. So this colony will move back and forth between these two sites um, during high water or flood events. And also later in the season of the maternity season in the summertime, it will naturally vacate this site anyway and move over to the alternate site for some unknown reason. A couple of times in 2008, 2013, we visited the site and there is a slight, small, high passage uh, in addition to the main passage that we think, or we suspect allows a bit of an escape for the passage or for the colony during high water events. We excavated that small passage twice, made it a little bit bigger each time in the event that uh, in high water events, the colony can successfully vacate without take occurring uh, to individual bats. We hope to visit that site, to vis visit the site again after the colony vacates here in November and see if even expansion, a greater expansion of that high passage can occur again to enhance the escapability of the colony during high water events. And, and that's, that's basically what we consider in study period two, is to make an inspection of that, that high passage. You can see if bats are using that passage, if you can see droplets or feces or uh, some type of uh, scat in the passage. You can see if they've used it. Um, this year, there was not a high water event that reached the, the point where the colony would be uh, vacated. But in the attempt that we can maybe excavate it even larger, that's what we plan to do, you know, or ins inspect and consider in study period two. Questions? Yes, we have one. Uh, Walker? Yeah, just, just really quick. Uh, when you, you know, you reference 752 PD, is that the water surface at the cave or at the dam? That's at the dam. And that's, that's okay. a good point, but it is at the dam, yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I appreciate it. 
one more question from Kevin Stubbs, Fish and Wildlife Service. Kevin? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, have you analyzed the potential impacts of project operations on the frequency or the duration of events that would get up to that 752 level? Repeat that one more time, Kevin, so I can catch you at the beginning. Well, you're probably not the one that would actually answer it, but my question is, have has GRDA analyzed any potential project-related impacts on the frequency and duration of elevations of water reaching that 752? None that I know of, Kevin, and other people in the room are shaking their heads, but uh, no. Well, that's what we would need to analyze potential you know, impacts or take uh, risks to the species for gray bats. And then my other question is, why didn't we include uh, northern long-eared bats in this uh, assessment of impacts to terrestrial species? That's a good point. Uh, in, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think that's addressed in the study plan determination, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is Sean, by the way. I, my uh, PC timed out here. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's talked about in the study plan determination or the revised study plan, one of those two. And I think it had to do more with these are cave obligates and um, the caves that are on the reservoir themselves, whereas if I'm familiar enough with northern long-eared bat, uh, they um, roost under uh, loose bark on trees, and um, therefore we felt that the project effects did not affect those types of habitat that would affect that population. I'm kind well, of going by memory here, though. I mean, you are correct that the northern long-eared bats uh, use the timber in the summer anyway um, but your you know potential flooding of timber you know could impact those bats especially when during the pup season when they can't fly um, so even the analysis I saw yesterday did show that at least the difference between project and non-project, you know, elevations, you know, the, up to 745, that it, in some instances, it did affect hundreds of acres, at least, of, of habitat that could be inundated. And certainly some of that habitat's going to have trees and could have northern long-eared bats in it. So I, I would argue you should include northern long-eared bats and it, and it should be part of your um, consultation for threatened and endangered species. Um, the other comment I have is that uh, for the American bearing beetle, I would recommend another season of surveys. Um, even though, you know, it, it's obvious from previous surveys, they're not abundant in that area, but you're you do have potential project impacts, you know, both flooding and potential land management actions that could disturb soil there and potentially have impacts to, to the beetles. And we can cover all those potential impacts through a consultation, but um, it doesn't, just six buckets in one year doesn't necessarily mean they're they're not there. And my other point is you're you're talking about, you know, a, a license that's going to cover at least a 30-year time frame. So, uh, you know, presence or absence, especially when they're known to be present, you know, not all that far away, uh, it, it, it would be worth another survey. That'd be our recommendation. 
Uh, Keith, can you put those comments so we can address that? Yeah. Here, Kevin, I'm sorry. Keith is presenting, sorry. <laughs> um, could you put those comments down in writing so we make sure that we have that, please? I said please. <laughs> Are you still on? Kevin, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on. Okay. I, okay. I, uh, I, I heard you were going to make it part of the record, and it'll be in our written comments as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, any other comments or questions on ABB or gray bat? Uh, Walker, I see you raised your hand. Yeah, so like some of the other studies, the, uh, the, the cover ISR, when it talks about the American burying beetle, um, I think, it, you know, we, we talked about a few different phrases in the context of the H&H &H study yesterday. Immaterial impacts comes up most often, but also appreciable difference. And I think that was the one used in the context of the burying beetle in the ISR. I'm sorry, my PDF reader is giving me trouble. I'll have my, uh, I'll find my way there momentarily here. Um, but my notes say page 24 of that ISR. I'm trying to find the quote so I can be clear on exactly how that's represented. Um, yeah. So it says the results of the H&H &H study demonstrate that future operational changes that may be implemented by GRDA within the conservation pool of Grand Lake will not appreciably influence water levels beyond the current project boundary. And, you know, we had some discussion about, you know, what's appreciable from a hydrologist's perspective yesterday, but I was just hoping you could explain, you know, what, you know, what makes a change in inundation appreciable from a burying beetle's point of view. I'm not even sure what what's being referenced, the, the appreciable difference. You're not clear where I was quoting from or what that's referring to? Where you're quoting from. I am on page 24 of the initial study report. Yeah, the cover Walker, report. This, this is Sean. Kuzin again, um, I selected the term appreciable because we haven't run the Lentic and Lodic maps. Um, so I don't really know, we don't really know exactly what the difference in inundation would be from uh, running the, uh, the Lentic and Lodic map analysis. Uh, but we don't expect it to exceed 750, which is the current project boundary. So you're, you're, you're basically asking a question that we're planning to work on in the next uh, study period. All right. Give me one second to make sure I understand. I think that might make sense, but hang tight. Okay. While we're waiting, we have another question um, raised by James Muckers with the Osage Nation. Uh, James, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure, thank you, and, and good afternoon. Um, I'm particularly interested in speaking with, and I'm sorry I didn't get, get your last name, Keith. Um, you were uh, discussing uh, DL2, and then in the report, uh, you discussed DL91 as well. Um, so uh, you state that it's, it's, it's under no threat by the, the uh, lake level, certainly not going to be inundated, apparently. Um, are, both, are, are both DL2 and DL9D1 located within the project boundary? No, just DL2 is located within the project boundary. Okay. okay I certainly understand um, keeping their exact location um, confidential for the purposes of the public report, uh, but I'll probably uh, 
ask for that specific location. Um, uh, Chuck, Brian, Jacqueline, if, if, if we could get that exact location, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and then might want to have an additional discussion. This is the first, at least we, we may have been told of this cave in the past. I mean, what, two, three years? Uh, I don't recall hearing about this uh, particular feature, um, and I'd like to know more about it. Um, particularly if uh, they're planning on in, in enlarging, um, uh, uh, it's, it's not exactly the mouth of the cave you're planning on enlarging, is it? That is correct. Right. Um, we'll likely want to uh, discuss this further tomorrow. It's a good plan. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, I look forward to, to the follow up and thank you very much, both of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you'll just unraise your hand for me, James, so I don't think you have something further, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, any other comment? Oh, Tyler Brickner. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, yes, from WSP, Burke yes. Contractor, WSP. I just had a quick clarifying question about the uh, American Burying Beetle surveys. Is it, um, it's my understanding that you're not proposing to do the additional surveys mostly because the the survey methodologies don't conform to the study area that you're looking to survey in, um, which I, I see that issue. I guess my question is, are you proposing therefore to assume presence in those areas or assume no presence? We would assume no presence because it is a low population area and the studies this year were all negative. Okay, thanks. We would assume negative. Thank you, Tyler. Do you have any follow-up questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, it doesn't look like anybody else has raised their hand or indicated in the Q&A they have anything. So, Stephanie, if you just have the last slide, I don't want to cut you like I did. Oh, yeah. That's, that's okay. Awesome. All right. I'm going to switch presentations to wetlands. I think we should take a 10-minute break. We're going to take a 10-minute break? Okay. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back at 2.25 and finish up the day. Okay, we're going to get started back with uh, wetlands and riparian habitat study. Stephanie? Uh, Stephanie, we're on the horizon. We, we are doing the wetlands and riparian habitat study. For this first study period, we took the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wetlands Inventory Maps and the GRDA Shoreline Management Plan Maps to um, put them together to identify, display, and describe the current composition of wetland communities within and adjacent to the study area. We used that data to develop a GIS database um, to define the extent classification of plant community structure of the habitats. And we use the GIS database to estimate the total acres of wetlands and riparian habitats that currently exist within the study area that we looked at. And for the purpose of the initial review, we use the upstream model extents provided by Mean Hunt to flip the habitat polygons from the, um, the source databases down to the um, limits, the upstream limits. So within those upstream limits, the database displays 4,236 acres of riparian habitat types and 54,981 acres of wetland habitat types, including cluster emergent, cluster scrub shrub, cluster forest of wetlands, and open water. So based on the results of the H, &H study, the second study period will determine project effects, if any, um, including habitat changes in currently designated wildlife management areas. We have, we have now applied the updated project boundary that Pink outlined, and you can see it's a significantly smaller area than um, 
what we were originally looking at. We'll overlay inundation maps generated by the comprehensive hydraulic model and then identify the extent, duration, and seasonality of inundation occurring within the project boundary. If it's determined based on the results of the h and study that anticipated operations impact wetlands in the study area, then GRDA will perform field verification of the cover type maps, ground truth any major deviations from preliminary wetland cover type maps, and update the database and the wetland acreages accordingly. Um, the results of the field verification will allow GRDA to provide a more accurate estimate of the acreage of wetlands that may be potentially impacted by anticipated operation of the project. Okay. Are there any questions for the wetland and riparian habitat study? Kevin Stumps, I see you raise your hand. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, how do you propose to determine, say, changes in wetland type, for, for example. You know, if you, if you raise the lake level to where it's at 745, let's say, more of the time, then you, you're certainly raising the water table nearby there. And so some wetlands are going to have water, you know, more, more often, let's just say. And you may be right. creating new wetlands, too, and uh, are and potentially degrading some other wetlands. Um, how are you, you going to determine those potential changes in wetland types? Well, it'll be based on seasonality and duration of um, the inundation. Um, if you're asking if a scrub shrub wetland would become open water if it's constantly inundated. I mean, is that, is that what you're asking? Um, <clears throat> partially, you know, or if it was a, you know, more of a, you know, flooded trees, if it was flooded too often, then the trees would die and you would have more of a, you know, shrub wetland instead of the flooded timber wetland, things like that. Um, yeah. Oh, well, that's what we'll be looking at in the second year, the, the next part of the study. Is there, does that, that answer your question, Kevin, or do you have something further? Uh, I, that's it for now. I just wasn't sure how you would uh, be able to quantify the, you know, the changes in duration and I guess how that would affect acreage and types. But, um, the, you know, the, the report was kind of vague, let's just say, on how you would do all that. But that, that's my comment that uh, there's certainly going to be changes just because one more information on how you analyze those things other than right. the, the field verification. Because, you know, if you went out and looked at a wetland, you know, the, the trees don't die right away, for example. If it has only been flooded, you know, more recently, in that year, it's still going to look the same. Right. I mean, field verification is just going to be a snapshot of that time. So I understand. We'll have to very clearly define why we've made the, um, a, during our analysis, we'll clearly define why we've made the changes or um, any, any suggested changes in the methodology that we've used. This first part of the study was just to create the database that we're going to be looking at in the future. So all of those things will be clearly defined. Okay. Thank you. Walker, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thanks. Just following up on that, um, 
I thought I understood from the discussion you just had with Kevin that the duration of inundation might be a pretty important determinant in, in whether and what kind of wetlands you've got. Is that right? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. You're really little on my screen. I, I thought I saw you nod. Oh, but. yes. Yes, <laughs> I, yes. That will have a, a huge impact. Yeah. And so I, I'm curious what sort of duration of inundation information you anticipate receiving from the H&H &H study? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with what is in the H&H &H study, so. Well, so the slide so, that's up now is talks about how the H&H &H study is going to feed into your, your future work, right? Yes. And so we need to, I mean, if your work is going to be looking at, you know, the extents and duration of inundation, presumably you'd need to have that duration information from the H&H &H study. Yes. I, I assume that it would be in there. I'm not familiar with what's in it. If so, I mean, well, hunk it. So. Yeah, Walker, so that, that is going to be an upcoming activity. So the H&H &H study is going to be doing duration analysis? If it is required from the other studies and is required in the study plan determination. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Sorry, that's all I had. Okay. All right, uh, if there are no other questions from anybody on this topic, we'll load the uh, cultural resources study for the public portion of this meeting. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Thad Bissett. I'm a senior archaeologist with uh, Wood Environment and Infrastructure. Um, we are responsible for the um, archaeology and architectural portion of the cultural resources study uh, for the relicensing. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a brief discussion of our work uh, within the project boundary um, for the last two years, 2019 to 2021. Uh, and I'll conclude with a, a very brief uh, reference to work in the next study period that we'll be doing. Uh, I'm going to start uh, just by noting that this relicensing, um, we're assisting GRDA in complying with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, as part of that compliance, um, required to take into, effect, uh, take into account the effects of project operation uh, and maintenance on all historic and archaeological resources within the APE um, project boundary that may be eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it also requires uh, taking into account effects of operation and maintenance on uh, properties of traditional cultural and religious importance, uh, traditional cultural properties or TCPs um, that may be eligible for the National Register. That's a, a part that uh, is being handled by another consultant, by uh, consultants. So to assist with this, the Cultural Resources Working Group uh, the CRWG was created. Uh, CRWG is a, is a really interesting uh, group composed of GRDA, um, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers and Tribal Representatives of 23 different Native American tribes from the region, uh, the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office, Oklahoma Archaeological Survey, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and representatives from FERC. Um, Quarterly meetings of the CRWG since 2019 um, have handled planning, review, uh, consultation, and discussion of this process. Um, there have also been additional communications outside of those quarterly meetings um, when needed uh, for, for, for various things. 
Uh, and basically, the CRWG meetings and the additional communication serve as a general forum for uh, consultation as a whole, uh, for discussion and review of the cultural resources findings, study plan, results, uh, and resource management, uh, and for additional planning activities relating to our ongoing cultural resources study. Uh, and all of this to assist GRDA to address the study objectives, which are, broadly, um, to determine the project boundary in the area of potential effect, um, to establish survey methods for the identification of historic and cultural resources, uh, and then to evaluate and establish uh, archaeological site significance, which includes identifying archaeological sites that have, have not previously been identified, uh, in consultation with the CRWG. Um, again, Another consultant is involved in the development of the uh, inventory of traditional cultural properties. And then, of course, to maintain the appropriate level of security for these, um, for these locations. Uh, the list of CRWG quarterly meetings is on the right-hand side of the screen. I'll note that uh, December 13, 2019 was the last in-person meeting until today or until yesterday. Uh, it's nice to see people's faces again. Um, all of this is intended to guide the process of the cultural resource uh, inventory and assessment within the FERC established project boundary, which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen and has been seen a number of times at this point. Um, the boundary encompasses approximately 57,600 acres. Um, Generally, the project boundary or the area of potential effect, uh, the APE, extends to the 750-foot contour. Prior to the initiation of our fieldwork activities, um, another consultant, Cox McLean, produced a pre-fieldwork study, um, essentially compiling background research and other information uh, to aid in conducting this, this study efficiently. Uh, among the findings from the pre-fieldwork study, was the identification of about 105 uh, archaeological sites that were previously recorded uh, within or in direct proximity to the project APE. Uh, the pre-field work study also includes um, reporting on a focused geoarchaeological study intended specifically to identify high potential archaeological uh, parts, uh, landforms within the project boundary. That is areas that um, Geomorphic processes have consisted primarily of deposition rather than erosion. Uh, they identified 29 of these uh, high potential landforms that uh, essentially have accumulated during the Quaternary period, which uh, encompasses the last 20,000 years and plus uh, within the area. They also identified a little over 60, uh, 60 linear miles of uh, bluff line along the shorelines of the lake. Um, maybe potential, high potential area for um, caves, deep overhangs, uh, other, area, uh, other areas that may contain uh, remains of cultural activity um, around the lake. And in addition, Wood also identified 12 uh, islands within the body of the lake, uh, at least two acres or more, um, that we consider to be high potential areas for additional survey. Obviously, these were not always islands. Um, at one time, they were relatively high elevation points within the, the river valley. So we've had several different uh, operations going on um, since 2019. Uh, one of these was to relocate and revisit uh, previously recorded archaeological sites within the APE. Um, archaeological surveys were done prior to the construction of the dam, uh, and so uh, there are a number of sites recorded within the lake and have been recorded in, from the 1930s through the 50s uh, and since. Um, archaeological survey standards and documentation practices have changed considerably in the last 80 years. Um, and so it was necessary in a lot of cases to relocate some of these sites based on uh, older records. So efforts to relocate the sites, then to assess the condition of the sites, uh, what sites may actually be uh, still above the water, uh, 80 years of, of um, Eighty years can, can, can significantly change site conditions and integrity. Um, once located, uh, it, it was occasionally necessary to do additional testing, subsurface uh, and surface testing, to identify the uh, overall area of the site and the depth of cultural deposits. And then, um, as part of that process, to make recommendations of National Register eligibility uh, where it was possible to do so. 
For the 2019 initial work, um, 38 sites were selected by the CRWG uh, as priority sites for evaluation. Uh, and then over the course of the remaining uh, time for the cultural resources study, we would revisit the remaining sites of the 105 um, if possible. We're also tasked with locating new sites, that is to say sites, not new sites, but sites that have not previously been recorded. Um, we use fairly standard archaeological survey methods for that, both subsurface uh, shovel testing um, and essentially surface testing, uh, pedestrian surveys, walking over areas uh, looking for artifacts on the surface, like you can see there on the photos of the, uh, the artifacts. Um, these are, again, intended to determine the area, um, both horizontally over the surface of the ground and vertically, the depth of archaeological materials. Again, to assess the site integrity um, and condition, and once again, to make recommendations uh, regarding National Register eligibility of these, of these resources. Third task was the location of potential bluff, rock, or cave shelter sites uh, within the body of the lake. Um, for obvious reasons, I don't have pictures of those shown. Um, these are highly sensitive sites uh, that contain uh, variety of archaeological resources that are, that are in need of significant protection. Uh, this is a boat-based survey primarily. As you can see, these shorelines are fairly steep. Uh, On-foot survey isn't really um, possible, and being able to sit back and view the, the full shoreline is, is, is fairly necessary. Uh, these are done during leaf-off conditions. Again, um, see the vegetation on the shoreline. Um, full vegetation would, would obscure a lot of view, a lot of, view of, the, of the shore. We document the locations, we photograph. We do not enter into uh, potential shelters or caves. We're not calling these um, sites as much as we're calling them potential sites or potential rock shelters. And that's partly for uh, safety considerations. Um, none of our crew are really schooled in rock climbing. Um, but it's also out of respect for the potential uh, types of cultural deposits within these kinds of sites and an explicit request of the CRWG membership. Just a little over a year ago, we did uh, conduct some National Register eligibility testing at three sites, uh, previously recorded sites within the, within the, within the project boundary. Um, that testing included remote sensing, first to identify any possible areas uh, in which buried cultural deposits, and including the possibility of, of uh, burials, were located. Um, targeted testing and excavation, subsurface testing, and then uh, where it was not possible to reach any deeper via standard uh, hand tool bucket augering to, to depths uh, below those, those limits. And finally, uh, our architectural historical assessment uh, of uh, above ground structures within the project area. Uh, documentation, review of previous findings, um, reevaluation or evaluation of the status and condition of the existing resources, and again, a National Register recommendations. Um, as needed. So to get into the, uh, the first task, results of our first task, the uh, re oh boy, that got messed up, didn't it? Um, revisitation and uh, reconnaissance of previously recorded sites. Uh, again, there were 30, 38 priority sites selected uh, by the CRWG for um, the initial reconnaissance in 2019. Of those, we had 14 um, cave rock shelter, bluff sites, um, and then you can see the, the breakdown there as well. Uh, 34 of those were selected initially, and then four cemetery sites at the bottom of the table were, were added at the request of the Cherokee Nation, also for review. Um, our findings indicate that 19 of these are submerged, uh, either, uh, well, submerged. Um, 11 of them are located uh, outside of the Project APE. Uh, we we tested at one site and found it to have been significantly impacted by long-term um, long processes. And then we visited and uh, recorded possible effects at seven sites that, that, that we recommended as uh, potentially at risk. There we go. I got it. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so these seven sites um, we recommended were, were at risk from uh, several processes. Erosion is one, erosion along a water body. Um, any water body is a potential risk for archaeological sites. Uh, recreational activity um, and looting and vandalism, both potential looting and vandalism, that is say, access, possible access by the public, uh, and obvious examples of that, such as this uh, little tunneled out hole here. Um, we recommend a number of protective measures to GRDA, uh, including uh, informational signage posted at public access points, um, GRDA police uh, regular monitoring of these sites, uh, and the eligibility testing that I referred to before um, from September. And these are the three sites, again, that were um, tested for eligibility um, last year. Since 2019, we've continued to visit previously recorded sites uh, and have, at this point, visited or attempted to visit almost all of them. Uh, there are a number of these, obviously, recorded prior to the creation of the lake that are, that are underwater. Uh, others uh, have been recorded uh, in the interim. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, in identifying these, uh, the contractor who, who, who did the work uh, used a sort of a two-dimensional analysis. So some of these appear to be much closer to the project boundary than they are, which is why we have uh, a number of these that are uh, evidently outside the APD, in fact. Um, two of the previously recorded sites um, have been uh, recommended as eligible for the National Register. Uh, Eleven of those we visited are previous, uh, potentially eligible. Um, two are distinctly not eligible. Two appear to have been destroyed, and again, 88 are listed as unassessed, and uh, I indicate why that is a, the, the case there. So those sites that have been uh, recommended as potentially eligible, um, additional testing is a possible management option for some of these sites. Uh, our second task, um, phase one archaeological survey, uh, or cultural resources survey uh, of, of areas within the project boundary, uh, began in January of 2020. Uh, Obviously, it was cut a little short in March of 2020 for uh, pandemic-related issues. Uh, we resumed in November, um, we'll continue through March of 2021. In our initial um, field effort, we surveyed uh, fraternity alluvial landforms and identified uh, eight previously unrecorded sites. In our second mobilization, we continued with quaternary, uh, QALs, quaternary, quaternary alluvial landforms, um, and islands as well, and documented 11 new sites. Uh, of these, uh, 13 are pre-European contact sites, Native American sites. Um, five are combination, Native American and, um, and post-contact sites. And then one previously undocumented um, Cherokee cemetery uh, in the, along the Neosho River in the north part of the lake. So 19 total. At this point, uh, recommendations and assessments for these sites, um, we consider three sites to be unassessed. These are sites that are located at the edge of the project boundary and for which um, uh, permission from adjacent landowners could not be obtained to chase these out. Uh, you can see on the top photo there, um, looking from inside of one of these, one of these unassessed sites to the, to the landform adjacent. Um, four of these were uh, uh, conclusively not eligible for the National Register uh, based on uh, lack of archaeological integrity. Uh, and we recommended 12 sites as potentially eligible for the National Register. These are sites that appear to contain um, intact archaeological deposits and therefore may have uh, additional research potential. As a result of our um, bluff slash rock shelter slash cave survey, um, the 60 and uh, 60 plus linear miles are broken up into 83 areas along the shoreline of the lake. Um, the survey has been able to, at this point, reach 61 of those. Some of these are in very shallow water areas uh, that were previously unreachable with the, uh, the boats that we had uh, available to us. But within those 61 bluff areas, we documented at least 24 possible um, locations. Some of these have multiple uh, apertures, so uh, in some cases it's more than 24, uh, but at least 24 of these. 
Um, the unsurveyed areas, 22 remaining uh, for future field efforts. Um, previously, we had explored a number of different options for reaching these. Uh, at this point, GRDA has been able to acquire um, technology that may be able to help us reach them um, with a bit less effort than we initially thought. Our National Register eligibility testing at three sites um, was done, in, as I said, in September 2020. It consisted of remote sensing, that is to say some geophysical survey, magnetometer, and soil resistivity to identify buried deposits and um, possible um, Native American burials and, uh, to avoid. Um, test unit excavation, one by one meter um, subsurface test units, and then bucket auger, as you can see there on the bottom right, uh, to reach deeper deposits than the, than the test units can safely reach. One site, um, 34DL48, or site one, um, was identified in the 30s um, as a rock shelter site, but when we visited the terrestrial portion of that above it, uh, we noted ar archaeological artifacts on the surface, as you can see in the middle photo there, and fairly shallow soils. Um, we suspected that there might be... Um, because of the quantity of material on the surface, additional intact deposits, and so recommended um, further testing at this site. When we conducted that testing, what we found was that, in fact, um, soils were exceptionally shallow here. Bedrock was, was very shallow, and um, there are not significant archaeological deposits present at this site. So we have recommended that this site is not eligible for the National Register uh, based on our testing. Uh, at site number two, uh, 34 MY220, um, we conducted unit excavation, subsurface testing. We identified uh, intact features at depths of a meter or more below surface, uh, including uh, diagnostic artifacts indicating um, deposits at least three to 5,000 years old and potentially much older. Uh, and bucket augering suggests that there are intact archaeological deposits down up to 14, 15 feet below surface. Um, that's significant. And, and so we have recommended that this site is eligible for the National Register based on the results of our testing. At site number three, 34 MY 282, um, we have evidence of uh, intact features at least 60 to 70 centimeters below surface. Um, multiple uh, diagnostic artifacts indicating multiple chronological, multiple chronological periods, cultural, cultural horizons. Um, and at this site also, uh, bucket augering shows uh, potential intact cultural deposits up to three meters or about 10 feet deep. So again, that's a, that's a fairly significant finding, uh, and so we have recommended this site also as eligible for the National Register uh, based on our testing. At the same time as we were doing that work, our architectural um, team was doing their architectural historical survey in the project boundary. Um, they examined 22 above ground uh, architectural resources. 17 of those have been previously recorded, so they reevaluated. Uh, and they identified five previously unsurveyed uh, bridges. Obviously, the Pensacola Dam Historic District and the Split Log Church, these are two National Register listed properties. Uh, there has been no change. These, are, these continue to be National Register eligible and, in fact, National Register listed. Two bridges within the project boundary, uh, the Steps 4 Bridge and the Spring River Bridge, were both uh, recommended National Register eligible previously, um, but our survey found that OK, um, Oklahoma DOT had demolished and replaced them in 2017 and 2018. So uh, they are no longer extant within the project boundary and, uh, and therefore no longer potentially eligible. Um, no other above ground structures uh, or resources were identified by our, our team as uh, National Register eligible within the project boundary. Upcoming study period, um, we have a few previously recorded sites that, uh, that still need to be visited and assessed, or at least uh, visits need to be attempted and assessed. Um, there were several uh, survey areas that were inaccessible either because of water levels or because of uh, nesting bald eagles. Uh, and so those need to be um, to be completed. And then over the course of this uh, this next study period, we'll be consulting regularly with GRDA and CRWG to identify other um, tasks, that, uh, including archaeological testing at, at, at sites to be selected um, by the by the group um, for additional testing. Uh, 
that concludes. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions for Thad related to his presentation? Walker, I see you've had your hand raised. I do, but I do. There's been a lot of me, so if anybody else does, they're welcome to go first. <laughs> no, just you. All right. Well, hi, Zed. First of all, I, uh, I want to say I, I like to see you uh, waving the wood flag. I worked for AMAC uh, back before it became wood up here in the Seattle area years ago and, in fact, uh, was an assistant on one archaeological dig with, uh, <laughs> you know, several of those folks. So that's, that's fun. I wondered if you knew Tim Garish, who I think is still uh, with wood up here. Uh, I don't. You know, yeah, I don't. You know Tim? Yeah. Um, my boss knows him. No. I don't know him. <laughs> <All right. laughs> nice. Well, it's a small world. Anyway, um, and I haven't kept in touch with him, to be frank, but I just I just wondered. I recall that he's something of an underwater archaeology specialist, so I wondered if you all had considered, you know, bringing in that expertise to look at some of those inaccessible sites. Uh, the underwater archaeology um, side of things, my understanding is that that is not part of the, um, the study plan. Uh, and uh, and so it's not part of this study, and I, I, I don't believe that that's um, something that we will be attempting to do in the next study period. Okay, and, and I'll be frank. Th you know, this study is not one that I've uh, you know dug into as much as some of the others. But uh, just wondered, since I happen to know you know <laughs> an underwater archaeologist in your shop, couldn't mm -hmm. couldn't but ask. Um, I, I did wonder though in the study plan determination, it notes. Uh, you know, the proposal uh, by GRDA to refine the APE in consultation with the Cultural Resource Working Group based on the results of the H&H &H study. Um, and I noticed in the, in the ISR cover report, it, you know, sort of addressed that. And if you've been here today, you've probably heard me read similar quotes a few times. But the ISR says the H&H &H study has found change in inundation that occurs at higher inflow events under changing starting water surface elevations or anticipated future operations is immaterial to the inundation differences caused by the magnitude of the inflow event. Uh, I, I think that's basically saying what Jesse was saying yesterday, that, you know, uh, different flood events have a, a much bigger impact under at least the parameters of the study as performed so far than the starting elevation for a given inflow. Um, so anyway, that's a lot of preface, but I wondered if you could comment on, you know, what degree or how as an archaeologist you evaluate the degree of change in inundation that's material to doing your work. Well, our effort has, has, has remained within the project boundary, um, <clears throat> and, and my understanding from, um, I believe, Sean gave a presentation yesterday discussing the, the any adjustments to the project boundary uh, and fairly specifically indicated that the cultural resources boundary would not be changing um, in, in, in future uh, work periods. So I have, to, I have to kick it to that and say we're going to stay within the project boundary. Um, we, we generally do that anyway. We don't really, we, I'm not involved in making um, hydrological determinations. I, I go where the line tells me to go. Well, I mean, I understand that, but it seems like the question of whether the APE ought to be expanded is more of an archaeological question than a hydrological one, right? The hydrologists tell you where the water goes, and I would think you think about whether that amount of water in that location has a potential cultural resource effect, no? Well, again, I, I, think, that, I think that that's something that, um, that I'm not prepared to comment on, given the, the project boundary is, is, has been defined for us. Um, and uh, archaeological sites are what they are, but we are working within the project boundary. And uh, Walker, this is Sean. Um, sure. It, I did do my short presentation yesterday where I talked about the purposes of all of the studies that we are doing here is determining the effects of the operation of the hydroelectric project. That's the purpose of relicensing. That's the purpose of all of the studies that we do during relicensing. 
And so if the Agent H study concludes that um, the project operation has a minimal impact upon the inundation upstream, therefore it's outside of the scope of studying anything to do with the upstream inundation um, uh, due to inflow events is outside of the scope of the requirements of the process. I mean, I, I think I understand your position on that, Sean, but it just it continues to seem to me as though whether a given impact is minimal depends on what resource you're looking at. And I think the discussion we just had about wetlands really typifies that, where duration of inundation is a key determinant, and that didn't have anything to do with the H&H &H study's determination about material impact. So I was Again, just trying to, to, to probe that in archaeology as well. It all goes back to the effect of the project operations. And that's why we start, We studied the first study year with a much larger study area to see if, if there, because we didn't know. Um, we hadn't completed the study. We had specul speculation that um, the upstream extent of the inundation had, uh, was due to the inflow events. Um, and the model has determined that, so therefore that's how we're proceeding because the H&H &H study effort has made that clear using the data and following the study plan that was approved by FERC. Well, so in the wetland context then, Sean, would you say that the H&H &H study determined that project operations have no material impact from a wetland point of view? Yeah. Because yeah. it seems to me the study just didn't address duration, which we just heard from your wetland person is an important factor. But we, we have a second year of study in wetland, which we will use the H&H &H study to determine the um, duration and um, maximum extent of inundation due to the operation of the project, due to the starting reservoir elevations, or the anticipated rule curve that they're going to follow. But you aren't doing that for infrastructure, for example. What's that? Well, the reason but we you... originally did infrastructure was it was based upon the assumption that project operations had an effect on the inundation. And if you look back in GRDA's comments to the original uh, request to do an infrastructure study, that's what we cited as a reason for not proposing the infrastructure study. Sorry, I didn't quite follow you there. Could you just repeat that? If you look at the origin of the infrastructure study, you look at the historical record that's with FERC. The reason why GRDA did not propose an infrastructure study is because it was proposed based upon the assumption that operations had an effect on the flooding upstream. So therefore, it should drop out of the study list because of the results of the H&H &H study, finding that the inflow event is the cause of that inundation versus the effect of the project operation. Yeah, but again, I think much like wetlands, an infrastructure impact can depend on the duration of the inundation and not just the peak. And you didn't look at that in infrastructure study. You're saying in wetlands, you're going to study it next year, but infrastructure, you're done for some reason. That's what I don't understand. Well, an infrastructure... Again, the scope of the study for the wetland has moved to the project boundary, the study area. I, I'm not sure you were listening to my presentation yesterday. Well, I've, I've done my best to listen to all of it, but I'm sure we can all agree there's quite a bit of water under the bridge in the last 48 hours. Is that a pun? <laughs> no. I think that the Corps of Engineers yeah, controls when, when <laughs> that water flows under the bridge. Sorry, say again? I was just continuing the bad pun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure it was good. I didn't, I didn't misheard you. I didn't mean to step on your punchline. Um, all right. Well, I, I think that's a, a, as good an answer as I'll ask you for right now, Sean. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. All right, are there any other comments or questions for Thad before we adjourn for the day? Um, appreciate everyone's attention and willingness to participate.
for those that will be participating tomorrow with the CRWG group, I think Brian has some closing comments. If you want to adjourn us with the deadlines and. Oh, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate everyone's participation again today. Uh, lots of information. So we have two deadlines. We will file our, our summary October the 29th and written comments and questions are due to FERC by November the 29th. Uh, tomorrow is a uh, closed meeting. Uh, so for those of you that are on there, we will see you uh, in the morning. And I thank everybody. All right, we're going to close the meeting and uh, we'll be sending out an attendee list uh, for today shortly. All right, thank you.